Hello and welcome to the show. This is the Cult of Conspiracy. And my name is Jonathan. I'm Jacob. And today we have one of, if not the, Flat Earth Goat. Welcome to the show, Mark Sargent. Hello. <laughs> and thank and thank you very much for having me, guys. I appreciate it. Oh, dude, this is, uh, this is yeah, this is going to be great. I've been looking forward to this for so long. You're you're. I was telling you in the pre-show, you're one of the people that really got me into this flat Earth stuff in the first place back in like 2015, 2016, somewhere around there. Yeah. And I mean, the way that you just describe, it's so easy. Like it's, it doesn't take some kind of, you know, genius to try and figure out a lot of this stuff. You put it right in your face and it's like, how do you, how is it possible to deny that the earth is flat whenever you describe it your way? And, uh, I mean, Jacob here, he's anti-flat earther, um, uh, globe, as some people uh, will call him. Uh, hold on. I am a globe tard. I am not anti-flat earther. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't want you to make it seem like I'm at odds with your tribe. I am not, sir. I so, respectfully disagree with some of the premise, that's right. but I do not disrespect the hustle that has gone into the knowledge gathering of the flat earth movement as a whole. But y'all do y'all's homework. But, but per the show, you are a conspiracy guy. I am, in fact. Well, you're halfway there already. It's I'm right. open to the idea, and I understand at least the premise. I yeah. get it. And I just personally disagree. That's all. That's all right. I, what? I'm not going to condemn everybody. Everybody in our community started out in in your neck of the woods, sure. and everybody had the everyone in the conspiracy. We'll call it the truther community, just because sure. it's shorter. Uh, you know, they've got their own wheelhouse, and I've talked to many, many of them. In fact, the clues um just turned. What day is it now? Yeah, the, the clues on the 10th turn nine years old. Go figure, nine years. Can't believe it's been that long. Wow. And in that time, I've talked to a lot of people that have believed in a lot of different things. And, you know, people for pe for most people, they've got this comfort line in the sand, which is, oh, no, everything on this side of the line, totally with you. That side of the line, it's fringe. I don't like that reality over there. So I'm going to stay on this side of the line until I'm ready to, and you know, that line moves depending on, you know, when you are exposed to different things, you know, everybody, I mean, I'm still learning new things every year. So no, it's good. I don't yeah. mind. I don't mind. That's why. Well, that's why um, we actually, uh, David Weiss actually challenged Jacob to this not that long ago. We've had David Weiss on a couple of times. Oh, that guy. Uh, yeah. We have a standing bet, he and I. And out of pure love, respect, and sheer ego alone, yeah, this bet is still standing. But, yeah. Well, and the, the bet is, is that if, uh, if, if Jacob eventually comes to the conclusion that the Earth is flat, he yeah. will get a tramp stamp tattoo of a flat Earth. And if I can convince David Weiss that the earth is not, in fact, flat, he will transfer three Bitcoin to my I was about to say, there's got to be Bitcoins involved. <laughs> if I did it, and, and for the record, I did not throw that gauntlet down. That gauntlet was cast upon me. But yes, of course, I took up the challenge because, you know, who, me and my ego. <laughs> who came up with it? Who came up with a tramp stamp idea? Yeah, but... uh, I believe it was supposed to be just a flat earth tattoo. And oh. it started there and it started with, oh, I'll get it on my shoulder, like a whole shoulder blade piece right. of the, the UN logo, something like that. Then it became David Weiss's face as a tramp stamp. <laughs> and I mean, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I, I got a hairy lower back. So even if I lose that in some way, shape or form, I'm going to win because he's going to look like an ape. It's going to be hilarious. You know, either <laughs> way it goes, I'm by winning. I win here and I win there. And, oh uh, what Charlie Sheen once said. That's awesome. Winning. Anyway. And, and, and by the way, I don't have it's one of the one of the several nevers I've done. I've never um, sent a text and I've, I've never gotten a tattoo, not because of against tattoos. And anyway, I, I know. In fact, I think women with, you know, sleeves are absolutely hot. Um, but yes, they are. I, I do. Um, uh, but I couldn't I never got one because I couldn't come up with anything that I that I deemed permanent enough that 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 I wouldn't want to make slight changes to. I always make little adjustments to everything. Like I'm terrible mm. with like brick and brack and so so even if I did get a flat earth map, right? You know, people say, oh get a flat earth map. It's like, yeah, but what if I have to make adjustments to it? Then what do right. I do? Then then it's like, oh that and and what, just one adjustment? No, that's not gonna happen. I mean, over the last nine years, we've made all sorts of different things, uh, modifications to it. So so yeah, I, no, I, I wouldn't have taken that bet. I would have gone with something else, but whatever. 
It's far that <laughs> David <laughs> Weiss, though, he and I have had such a checkered past. And I don't mean that like we fight. He's a great guy. Yeah. But I've noticed that he and a lot of the flat earth community, we yeah. have had varying degrees of flat earther be from the novice to the professional and everywhere in between on the show. And I've noticed that by and large, the longer somebody has been pushing the flat earth, uh, I don't want to say narrative, the flat earth message, if you will. You can say narrative. That's fine. I, narrative immediately comes off with a negative connotation, and I don't want to be that guy to throw it that way. I, but it is what it is. But but go ahead, go ahead. I've noticed that they get more and more not hostile, but super defensive, like from the word go. And initially, that turned me off to the movement because I was like, these dudes are always talking at you about flat Earth, and it's like a whole fucking thing. But then I was like, all right, maybe it's just like an aggressive person, and that's just how they are about everything. They're super into whatever. But then it dawned on me. 90%, if not 99% of the flat earth community are usually defending their viewpoint to other people who are trying to shove things into their face. Yeah. So naturally their go-to response when explaining flat earth is in defensive mode. So yeah. it kind of checked out and sadly so. It's like if I was trying to start a new religion and everybody that was ever proselytizing about it was a dick, because everybody treated them like shit. That's not going to bode well for the movement. But at the same time, yo, if you get shit on by everybody, I understand. No, no, no. Yep, I, I got it. And and with David, um, you know, he, I, I listened. He solicited a lot of interviews when he when he started out, and so he was getting quite a few hostile interviews. Whereas I had people that were reaching out to me, but for the most part, they were they were pretty much soft. You know, they I wasn't getting a huge amount of pushback. And so what David did was he figured out, you you know the saying very well, um, sometimes the best defense is a good offense. Absolutely. And and that's what David did was he just, he would, he figured out that if he hit people with enough sciencey, spacey facts, just general, you know, generic solar system facts, that he could put people on their heels for what they don't know. Meaning, you know, people are listening to this right now. And again, this is rhetorical. You don't have to respond. But if I see, you know, how fast is the Earth spinning on its axis and how fast is it going around the sun and how fast is the solar system flying sideways through the galaxy and how fast is the galaxy traveling through the universe? I most could people don't of, know that off top. But most people don't. The, right. point, the, the, the point that David throws out, there, and he throws out a lot more, where it's like, okay, if you don't know that, why are you defending it? And... And it kind of it throws people a little bit, and I get that. And in fact, it took me a while, and I don't try, I don't try to use it that much because I don't like putting people on their heels, if I can Fair. if I can help it. However, it is a good point. Which is like it's like you're defending. I'll, I'll, let me use a, a quote really quick. Um, it was a George Orwell quote. You know, the guy that wrote in 1984, right? And and he said, uh, uh, and he he wrote this in 1946. Uh, he, he was not a flat earther, but he goes, he goes, you know, if you walk down the street and you ask the average person how they know the world is a globe, it's a knee jerk response. They'll come right back at you. Well, you. well, we know it is a known thing. It's a fact. And he goes, really? How do you know? Right? You don't have a spaceship. How, how do you know it's a globe? Right. And remember, this was 12 years before NASA was even founded. How did everybody on the street know that it was a globe and then they all of a sudden any any mentioned that the pushback gets kind of angry because they realize they don't know they were told you know if you're not some scientist that is convinced that it can be done through math right the average person on the street joe blow johnny lunchbox whoever well how did they know in 1946 12 years before nasa was even founded it was a globe it's like no they didn't know they were told and their father before them and their father before them going back generation after generation and I always thought that was interesting. It's part of the conditioning. Again, it's the only thing we debunk to children. You know, we put that globe in the classroom. We set it there in the corner right underneath the American flag. It has an amazing effect, right? You know, the American flag sits, sits there for 12 years, at least to get out of high school. There's people that join the military partially because they see the freaking flag in the classroom every day. It's like, yeah, it's my flag. It's where I'm from. It's, I'm willing to defend that. I, that's the globe. That's where yeah. I live. I'm kind of willing to defend that too, mentally. So if, let's go back in time a little bit to the... As we know of, quote unquote, if we believe history, which is a lie agreed upon and all the things to say that the ancient Greeks, right, quote unquote, knew that right. the earth was round. What is your your thoughts on this? Uh, and and why, because of the experiment with the sticks and the shadows. Yeah, the sticks and the shadows argument. Yep, 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 yep. Uh, the, and by the way, we we on our side, and I'm sure you've heard this before. Hope, hopefully David says this, maybe he doesn't. 
we don't in and I and again that's almost that's almost proof that you are absolutely on the other side of the line because we don't say round, we say globe, we say sphere, we say ball because it's three dimensional. Round can be a dinner plate, it can be a hubcap, whatever. whatever. Fair enough. But when it came to the Greeks and the sticks and shadows argument, which most of the time I don't even have to deal with because the average person doesn't even understand it. Even if you like spend a half an hour with the average person in the street and said, oh yeah, sticks and shadows, you know, and the wells and how the angles go. It's like right. the sticks, what, what they don't realize, and and you, you kind of get this, uh, which is the sticks and shadows argument works very, very well if the sun is also very close and very small. And you can test this out with a with a flashlight and, and some sticks on a flat surface or you know some sort something that stands vertically. Right. And that's what we say. It's like, oh yeah, the sticks and shadows argument works great if the sun is hundreds of thousands of miles wide and 93 million miles away. But it also works really, really well if it's only three thousand miles away and uh, say fifty to seventy miles wide. So right. at, that, at that point, it's like, okay, and again, the Greeks. And I don't want to steal a line from from the series Rome, Rome, where they said "f the Greeks." Uh, I won't swear. Can we swear on this? this, this yeah, podcast? we can swear on this yeah, podcast. Oh, okay, but also, good. it's funny that they said that, even though they based their entire civilization off of sucking Greek dick, basically. <laughs> Whatever. Whatever. I, I guess we're just gonna miss the whole part of the the Iliad, and then the whole offshoot which led to Romulus and Remus. But fuck Greece, even though we're modeling everything off the bastards. But whatever. I hate. I hear you. I hear you. Uh, but when it when it comes to, to Greece, I will throw them into the minority in that. Again, if you go into any search engine and you type in ancient cosmologies and click on images, everybody drew the same thing, which is interesting. They drew snow globes bef a thousand years before we had freaking snow globes. And mm -hmm. everybody drew. And of course, why? Why wouldn't they? You know, it, the the. The objects, you know, the, the stars in the sky or whatever the lights in the sky seem to go over a curved path and you can only see so far. It's like, oh, OK, well, it's got to be some sort of circular thing with a, some sort of domed surface over it. So um, and I think even the Greeks are uh, early on wrote that. Now, did they try to ta talk their way out of it with math? Sure. But like I try to tell people, look, math, math's not going to save you in the end. Remember, math can describe math, math explains things but it can't do the experiments for you and eventually you gotta get high enough like with anything you know kind of like the um uh sorry again a little tangent kind of like the uh, the core of the earth experiments which is oh yeah they know what's down there until they started drilling and then they were wrong and they were wrong and they were wrong and then finally they just ran out of, they, they couldn't drill any further which was interesting because they didn't even make it to eight miles and yet we see the cross sections in the book. You know, I we don't question it where we're growing up. You know, you remember the the children's books where it's like, oh, you know, you've got your your red and your orange and your yellow and your your white center, right? And they're all perfect, one thousand mile thick, perfectly you know symmetrical bands, and nobody even questioned it. It's like, well, yeah, what's well, the deepest hole ever drilled? It's if it's four thousand miles to the center. It's like, oh, eight miles. It's like. Well, how do you know the rest? And you you won't go into Wiki, and they even say in Wiki, it's like, oh yeah, we really don't know what the hell's down there. We're just extrapolating from volcanoes and whatever. So sure. anyway, sorry, I go off. I know you've got a list of stuff. Well, there was, you know, I kind of just wanted to bring up because uh, I know that that's always uh, a pretty big uh, talking point that's brought up as well. You know, you had what's his name that had the ball on his back, right? Um, oh, Atlas was, was carrying Atlas, Earth on his shoulders, which yeah. we already debunked that that that's not it wasn't Earth. But, At Atlas shrugged. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, here's here's my thing. Why do we look at past civilizations as if they were also always telling the truth and never lying? Do we do we really believe that we're living in the only time where humanity has ever been deceived by history? And Maybe they were too. We, uh, yes, you, you got a point there. In fact, nobody's brought it up quite that way before. Gold star for that. I've done a lot of these things and nobody's actually said it like that. I think back in the day, yes, deception. Oh, good Lord. Um, what the, the quote you had earlier from Napoleon, you know, lies, lies that are agreed upon. When it came to the really big things back in the day, there was no real good reason to lie because you didn't have control of your world. Meaning you didn't have a you didn't have a sense of scope. Remember, you know, America, even there are people in, in the Middle East I've talked to not even that long ago that still call America the new world. Blows me away. It's like, really? It's like, oh yeah, that's where we, we want to go there. It's like, you're still using that term? Wow. We we don't use it anymore. But 
I, I don't think the old civilizations had the the quite the motivation. Um, there was a little rant I did a while ago where I was talking about America in general, and I called the the rant the I don't I won't rattle off the whole thing, but um, it was called uh, Impossible Greatness, where yes, Ro I call I call Rome you know the greatest empire ever because you know they just dominated through brute force, right? And I call them the Wilt Chamberlain. Of of empires, you know, you would say, think oh, no. be the Wilt Chamberlain over Britain, bro, D dude. Look, look, showman, showman or showman. LeBron James is a hell of a talent. Michael Jordan, I consider him the the finest showman that there ever was, and I consider America the Michael Jordan of empires. Here's the difference, though. I would go to Michael Jordan. I'm old enough. To, I would go to Michael Jordan's uh, away games when he would play in Seattle. Because I wanted to see him dunk on people. I wanted him to posterize somebody, right? What people don't know about Chamberlain back in the day, and the, you know, he just missed his window because the media wasn't just wasn't there back in the day, was they booed him when he went into the arena because they couldn't stop him. Right? Yeah. You know, you know, especially that 1962 season where he averaged 50 points a game. It's like 50 points a yeah. game, right? People who don't know his yeah. numbers sleep on him. Like, look, I understand oh. Michael Jordan is the greatest of all time in the same route that, like, Babe Ruth is the greatest of all time. It's a legendary status. But sure. if we're talking true numbers across careers here, yo, oh, Will Chamberlain was an absolute fucking animal. Oh, yeah, I remember, I remember bu specifically buying, like, the 1980 Guinness Book of World Records as a kid. And... I didn't even know. I didn't know much about basketball, right? I remember looking like the record section of basketball. It was all him. He yeah. was it. I at one point I was like, oh, well, he is basketball. Apparently, I I didn't know. I, I didn't know. I, only later when I looked up. So the point was is that when Jordan came into the league, yes, he was a hell of a showman, right? America, we are okay. I, I don't. I, I'm not slamming on the country. Trust me, I love this place. But uh, we're, we, are, we are the greatest show on earth. And there's a reason why uh, the Soviet Union for the longest co time called us the empire of lies. Right. We we created a myth that is we created. We are so much larger than life out there that at one point during the 60s this is, again, speculation on my part. But, but go with me on this. That when the other when the rest of the world was rebuilding their smoldering ruins after World War II, right, we were just surging forward. And that at one point, we decided to take the leap, which was, you know what? Let's do something that Rome, Caesar wouldn't even have thought of. Let's freaking go. To, let's let's do the moon thing, right? Can we go to the moon? Doesn't matter. Everyone will believe we went because we're America. And America in the 60s was unfreaking touchable No one could touch us. No one, whatever we did, that was gospel. And, and, and so, which is why I called it impossible greatness. We, we did it and it didn't, again, didn't matter what was true, or what, what wasn't true. We, we sold that story. We, we, we threw it to our media empire, which was growing very, very quickly. And then they spread out to the rest of the world. And how I know this is that when I would go to the other countries, you know, cause I've done different conferences in, in different countries over the last nine years, when I would go there. I asked them. It's like, yeah, I know why Americans have to believe in, in Apollo, right? The Apollo program. Because, in fact, I'll, I'll, you guys will know this. Um, Dana Perino from Fox News. She had this wonderful little quote. She said, when people were questioning you know, the moon landing, right? They were doing a little show on that. And she and remember, she was a press secretary for the Bushes back in the day. And she goes, I believe in the moon program because I'm a patriot. Haunting the way she said that, which was, we're the government and you live here you do what we say and you believe what we say because we know what's best for you right so my point was when i would go like i asked some some people in sweden i go i, I big big crowd of people right in front of me i go why do you guys think the americans went to the moon right everybody answers the same way well because it was on television and your news would never lie about something like that and I'd stare at them and I'd go, wow, we are really that good. America is so good. That and, of course, we're, we are. I will say this, though, in, in defense of, of, of what we are. Um, and you guys know some of this stuff already, which was I call us, um, you know, scary America. Uh, even though we put, put ourselves deliberately or not deliberately in some sort of position of weakness recently. I've ne we've never looked as weak as we are. Right. Absolutely. We still have incredible 
incredible toys out there and systems of defense that are that scare the crap out of everybody um the the real quick which is again you you know some of this which is um carrier groups one of the scariest words you could ever say carrier groups right britain yeah. has britain has two russia has two china has two italy has two and uh france has two right totaling 10 yeah. we have 11 yeah we have more than every other country combined and not to mention two of those are nuclear powered just so everybody on earth understands what America's fucking with. Yeah. Just saying. Yeah. I, I call ourselves and and because because you know, we've been trying to start something. I, I firmly believe that we've been trying to start a major conflict in either uh, the European theory, theater or the Asian theater. You know, Taiwan, we can't we can't get Taiwan to take or China to take a crack. Uh Ukraine, Russia's too KG. They can't. They're, they they're just not... realized how bad their defenses are. Xi Jinping didn't know. Because yeah. he's surrounded by yes men until the time came and he realized his rockets are full of water. Yeah. Yeah. I, the the <laughs> I, analogy I give is I go, imagine a really big drunk bully hits in the parking lot after hours, after the bar closes, right? And all the guys around him, they want to take a crack at him. They do. And he's staggering. He's barely on his feet, right? But this guy's huge, right? And he is absolutely freaking strapped from foot to head in everything you can imagine right holsters and grenades and blades absolutely and you realize it's like yeah he's still standing but if we don't take him out instantly we're screwed he is going to just decimate us and every anyone that's even close to us and that's that's what we we've kind of created this myth that is so much larger than life we've scared everybody i mean again it's a quote the the, the quote the david bowie song from years ago i'm afraid of americans it's like, yeah. I mean, look, say what you want, but that has given us a little bit of a safety cushion from oh, yes. external bullshit up until, you know, quote unquote terror attacks, which are in and of themselves an issue. I mean, hell, look at our southern border. Look at what's going on with Texas. Yeah. The IEDs that were found there, the terrorists that is now on U.S. soil that made it across the border and that video went viral. Like you said, you we can we can argue back and forth whether this was uh done to where we look weak per like on purpose or if this was done over a long period of time on accident and over incompetence this being a conspiracy show we believe that this was done meticulously to yeah. plan yeah and and part of me and you can go one of two ways uh and it, which is it's either a, a giant sinister plot by the new world order because america is too much of a pain in the ass, or too much of a loose cannon, and you've got you can't have a new world order with America the way it is now. You just can't, because people look at still look at us. It's like, well, what's America doing? We gotta, you know, we we wouldn't even implement the metric system for God's sakes. Um, right. Or it's a setup, which is, and I'm not talking like a Trump setup type thing, where we're doing everything we can to bait someone to come at us, so we can finally flex whatever we've got and just. You know, as much as I'd like, and I don't want to talk about too much military stuff unless you want to, but yeah. I remember, you know, I used to criticize Patton back in the day, you know, after World War II was over, uh, where, and, and the stories are true, where he's like, he's like, we are in a position to take it all right now. He's going, Russia is burning. We could finish them and we could have it. We could take the whole thing. Right. And. And NATO at the time, you know, the all everybody was like, no, that's bad form. You know, you, that's just rude. <laughs> but Patton was Wait. a true, you know, he he knew. He's like, oh, he's like, so, you know, maybe I I don't know. It's I am curious to see how this border, the infiltration thing. I'd hate to think that it's gonna be as as predictable as the beginning of Red Dawn, which they didn't have the money to shoot those scenes at the beginning. The, the beginning right. of the first Red Dawn, which, you know, it starts with the paratroopers already there. But then you yeah. hear the story from the fighter, the fighter pilot that was talking. It's like, oh, yeah, they infiltrated with uh, commercial jets coming up from the north and the south with guys that looked like normal people, but they were crack troops. And you tried to, to cut off the country, but they didn't have the budget to, to shoot all those scenes. So they just talked about it and it was just glossed over. It's like, yeah, that's that. Every, everyone knows how to attack America. Nobody's done it. But everyone knows how. Anyway, anyway, sorry. You know, you, it's interesting you bring up Patton yeah. uh, because have you ever seen this correlation? I'm going to share the screen right quick. Mm. Have you ever seen that Patton and Trump look a lot alike? 
I mean, they, they do kind of look like yeah. similarities. That's kind of crazy, right? Well, you know, that lower shot, the um, the one where Trump's on the left and Patton's wearing the, the beret right there. Yeah, where that guy right there. I hate to say this, but George C. Scott, I don't know when the last time you, you watched the 1970 classic Patton, but George C. Scott, I think, played Patton better than Patton. I got to say, I am a fan of the movie. It's one of my all time favorites. Yeah. And I would, I, the, the actor himself was phenomenal. I think he may have done Patton better than Patton, too. Yeah. I, I don't know. I've seen some of Patton's speeches or at least heard them played back and stuff. And like, it's nice, but ah, this guy, yeah. he, he, he knew how to move an audience. Yeah. And, and think, by the way, one more thing about Patton, which I liked, uh, which was the Germans had so much respect for him that they were convinced that you know because you had to take a pick on where where d-day was coming from and and Patton was bait he was the he was the diversion d-day and they were like no if if we're gonna go with an actual d-day we're gonna go wherever he is and they took the gamble and they lost on that one and uh, people don't understand it's like oh d-day was this great thing it's like no because they went after Patton and there was nothing there they had their their forces the, in the absolutely in the wrong place yeah, but, people don't understand how bad D Day could have been oh, if the diversion oh, had happened. Oh, and dude, then I, come to find out, the only reason why the American beaches were so bad is because the tanks didn't get there like they were supposed to. Yeah. I just watched this whole video about how apparently, did you know tanks can float? Apparently, they made the pa the Sherman tanks floatable strictly for the D Day landing. The guy who invented them and basically invented blitzkrieg tactics and invented tank warfare as we know today. Yeah. The guy was an absolute mastermind behind tanks. It was fascinating to watch. Anyway, we are going off on a yeah, whole. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I could go on and on. But yeah, there was a <laughs> lot of things. Look, a lot of alternate histories, and I do believe in alternate timelines and alternate histories. World War II was where there were a lot of lightning strikes that had to happen in succession for America to win. So that when I finally, because um, when the Man in the High Castle series came out years later, uh, when I watched that, because of course it was based on books and stuff, you people have no idea. It's like, no, no. And I think 99 out of 100 timelines, the Germans took it. They just yeah. took it outright. And even even as even late in the game, like when that British expeditionary force went over to France to check things out, you know, 500,000 men and they were pinned, absolutely freaking pinned. And like without like all the, the civilian boats that came over and grabbed it, it's like, no, oh, it was over. P people understand if that half a million went down, um, uh, UK surrenders. And that was yeah. and that was it. In fact, um, I love I love the little side story, how um, JF Candy was a Joseph Joe. Joe Kennedy, the father, how he was the ambassador to England at the time. And he was like, oh, no, surrender, S surrender now. And that he because he wanted to be president of the United States. And he and but he figured, you know, cut his losses. And because he said that he was never going to be president. And so that's when he pushed his sons forward. So yeah. weird. anyway, sorry. Well, I, I wanted to bring this up, too. What? And, uh, you know, because uh, we were talking about NASA a little bit earlier yeah. and, uh, you know, that was kind of really the clincher on why not not the main reason why, but uh, one of the big reasons why people across the world look at America as a superpower was yes. because we went to the moon. Right. Yep. yep. Well, I kind of wanted to bring this up, too. You know, a lot of those rocket scientists, they came over you know, from like Project Paperclip, right? Yep, yep. And people forget that, yeah, we did get rocket scientists as a result of Project Paperclip, but we also got a lot of sketchy human, uh, human manipulation of the mind or MK Ultra. We brought that shit over at the same time. And so it's whenever everybody is watching on the news, you know, everybody's going, you know, we're going on the moon, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin. Nobody thinks about the cameraman that was already there. But, yeah. um, you know, whenever that's happening, in my in my opinion, and it's obvious, it was mass MK Ultra, And that was probably their plan all along. Right. Could have been. Could, absolutely could have been. Uh, you know, it's a funny thing about war, which I, you know, people don't, little things they leave out, which is if you're really intelligent, if you've got a really big brain, you're not getting, there's no firing squad for you. No, 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 you're an asset. You know, you, you, there is a dollar value tied to you. And so when the uh, Pro Project Paperclip, when they divvied up, you know, the Soviet Union and the, the United States divvied up the 
the high level scientists and don't think for a second and I, i'm not trying to criticize the events but don't think for a second that the all the medical records from you know the nazi experimentation were burned hell no i mean there are pharmaceutical companies that would pay through the freaking nose for that stuff Some even of the today. most valuable assets absolutely Between or that or the information yeah, you know, found out by uh unit 731 in japan same thing the human experiments yeah understanding of what we know about human anatomy now yeah. through experiments that no one had ever done before because why would you ever do these but that evidence and that data is still used today yeah yeah why yeah why would you get rid of it now of course there, there's morals you know there's there's an ethical question there but it's like yeah but when do eth when you get to a certain dollar level and i don't care what industry you're in ethics go out the window it's uh, you know the, the don't don't ever think for a second that uh, you can put a price on well that you can't put a price on human life. A anybody that knows that you know anything knows that absolutely. I mean, come on, use the every American war we've ever had. My favorite would be the um, uh, the Alamo, which is right. You sacrifice two hundred guys, give or take, right? A couple heroes, Davy Crockett, rest in peace. And uh, and what do you get for that, right? You set, you let them, you do not send reinforcements. You let that fort fall. And what do you get? Oh, you know, little things like Texas and New Mexico and Arizona and, you know, that worthless piece of real estate called California. Trillions of dollars. Trillions yeah. of dollars for 200, for 200 guys. Oh, my God. Or the battleship Maine. I mean, the battleship Maine, about the same thing. A couple hundred guys. What do you get? Guam, the Philippines, Puerto Rico. Could have taken Cuba if you spent a little more time and effort. I, I love um, Teddy Roosevelt's famous quote after that. He goes, he, the Spanish-American War, he's going, oh, that's a fine little war. <laughs> because it was perfect. No, Spain didn't even see it coming. I just love that fact. The fact that you, that you probably know the story where they, like, they rolled into this harbor. One of the destroyers rolled into this harbor. And Spain had no idea, right? And then yeah. they, they come out with the boats. Hey, guys, what's going on? Right? And they're like, yeah, yeah sorry, you got to go back to the beach. We're, we're going to attack the fort. It's like, why? They're like, because we're at war. We are? When? Uh, since about like two weeks ago. You haven't heard? No. So they went back. <laughs> they had to take the fort. Oh, my God. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, you absolutely can put a price on human life. And to you, I'm sorry, let's segue back into that real quick, which yeah. is the, the, the whole NASA thing for America was it was the exclamation point on an already stellar run. Again, World War II, we, we escaped with barely a scratch. Oh, yeah, we got a memorial over in Hawaii. But um, you guys know, I mean, come on, we we can we knew almost to the man how many people we lost in World War II. And I, I try to tell people, look, I'm, I'm Soviet Union is is a great villain for us. Right. I, I try to go, look, they did a lot of heavy lifting in World War II. Do you know how many people they lost? We don't know. We can't even round to the nearest million. They lost. Yeah. They, the Germans were ripping up so many areas so quickly they couldn't even keep accurate records they were just estimated it's like how many people lived in this province uh, five million okay <laughs> to just... be honest with you though that's very indicative of communism and marxist ideologies in general somehow their numbers are never actually true no matter what side they're on whether they're positive or negative i'm gonna be honest with you sure Sure. But by the same time, again, the fact that we could, you know, narrow it down to that. So so when when we got to the point in the 1960s, when we created NASA, uh, we we were on our we our reputation was. 100 percent credit, you know, it was absolutely could not touch it. Why would you touch it? America? And come on. That was part of my rant was, look, we invented everything you ever used. Right. And now other countries made it better, but the inventions probably came from us because we had the time. It's like, oh no, it's like we're, nobody's doing anything. Just start inventing crap. Industries were popping up everywhere. It's like, oh, so it was awesome. So yeah, and this and the space program was was a perfect thing for that, and it was a wonderful vehicle to to siphon money. I mean, what's the budget up to? Sixty million a day. It's a lot of money, and that's just for for the NASA side of things. But don't don't get me started on SpaceX. Anyway, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. No. It's just point. interesting how how easy it is to manipulate the masses through just TV, because most people are very tribal. They they follow through tradition, not through right. actual thought. Right. And I, I think that most people believe that we went to the moon, that, you know, that our country is not lying to us, that our leaders are, are doing everything in our best interest. They believe that. 
because maybe their parents believe it and maybe their parents believe it because their parents believed it. And it's it's good to be an American. It's good not to question if we're the good guys or not. Obviously, we're the good guys. Right. Right. And so it's so easy to manipulate whenever you got people who are uh, kind of uh, following blindly and not not holding anybody else accountable because we just assume we're the good ones. Yeah. And back in the 60s and- when the moon landing happened. Right. Yeah. How did people get their information back then? We didn't have a uh, worldwide news rolling 24 seven. We didn't have the big dogs, the Fox and the CNN. It was your local news provider on one of three channels. Yep. Right. And that was across the world. And where did your local channel two news get their info from? The same source that every other state's channel two news got their info from. Yeah. So you want to talk about how controlled the narrative has been for forever, even back in the day, quote unquote, when America's, you know, the politicians cared and the news anchor told the truth, all of that. Right. Bro, news has been scripted for so far back. Oh, God. Do you you guys I know you I know you've seen it again. Conspiracy podcast. Of course you would. Um the the montages of all the local stations that use almost the exact same verbiage you know they pile them on top of each other the same you script know, when, yeah. you know who was the guy that first discovered that was uh, conan o'brien his his team because they worked for i think it was npc at the time you know they're they're in the the, the big control you know they have access to the big control panel so they have access to all the freaking affiliates right and all of a sudden a couple of those guys started picking up it's like wow national must be feeding a lot of these affiliates the same stuff and so what they did was they grabbed some segments of that and com- did a compilation and they ran as a comedy routine on conan every once in a while they didn't get the reception that he thought of course you know there was some canned laughter added to it but after a while they're like yeah that's kind of creepy that the local stations are using you know national scripts and again because it, most of the time it's because media is lazy you know, and that is, of course, you know, if, the, if if they don't have to do extra work, yeah, they'll take the, the national script and do their own version of Ron Burgundy. Absolutely, they will. Sure. And but yeah, nowadays, oh, my God, it's blatant, especially. Well, I mean, once the, you know, the whole shot in the arm thing came out, oh, that was bad. And now, of course, you know, it, it's they're so easy to spot, you know, because they use the you know, little little things, you know, like, you know, fake news is is dangerous for our democracy. You know, something as simple as as that statement. And you hear it over and over and over. And it's like, yikes. But yeah, to your, to your point, um, media. Uh, the, uh, let, I, I got a quick story for you, which is the, the media conditioning. People are so tied to their screens and they've been tied to their screens for a long time. And, and you, you I'll, I'll give you a quick bit of trivia. You probably don't know. I'm old enough to remember the uh, the G.I. Joe cartoons from the 1990s, right? You yeah, know, G.I. Yeah. Joe, the real American hero, you know, against Cobra. Back way before the movies, it was it was the animated show. And knowing it's, is half the battle. There G. you go. Joe. And what you what they did was, which was very clever, was they made the commercials for the toys the same animation team that was doing the cartoon show and they only ran GIG com- commercials between shows and they ran back to back shows. Right. So it was pushing what it was an hour plus of nonstop GI Joe. But here was the thing because it was using the same animation, the kids, again, if you're engaged CIA, you know, pays top dollar for this, mm-hmm. which is if you're engaged, you don't know the difference between when the commercial ends and the show begins. So it's just a full-blown hour-long commercial. And as anyone, if, you, if you've read any manuals, after the first 40 minutes, it's it's technically brainwashing, right? So what was happening was the kids were were at the grocery stores with their parents, right? And it was something different. Everybody knows, you know, you go to the grocery store. It's like, hey, mommy, you know, put a toy in the bot thing, you know, put a toy in the basket. It's like, nope, nope, nope. And they put a G.I. Joe in the basket, right? And mom was like, no, no, we're not putting it in there. And the reaction changed. The kids were like, oh no, you're putting the toy in the basket, <laughs> right? And they were a huge pushback against the mother. I mean, to where it was, you know, their their faces changed to where it's like, oh no, it was it was straight up zombie. It's like, I want the G.I. Joe toy in the basket, mom. You know, just like relentless, to where the mothers started comparing notes. And all this next thing you know, the local congressmen are getting calls and they had to, they ran it up the national chain to where it uh, early on in wiki some years ago it was called the uh, the gi joe clause which was they had to change it's like no you cannot run your own commercials during your own shows you know you are absolutely forbidden from from doing that and Wait now it's 
I'm so, sorry. Oh, what? wait a minute now. I remember about the time when this clause was passed, and I didn't realize that that was all right. All right. Now Jonathan, you, kinda, you, you remember a little bit of this? Okay. It, I remember it, but adjacently. So I remember the G.I. Joe era. I had like 12 of them myself. I'm going to be honest. I was that kid. Fuck it. All right. You know, whatever. Barbie's for boys. It is what it is. They were cool. They had machine guns. Anyway, Jonathan, I want you to think back. You remember Disney Channel in the 90s, right? The the era, the golden era of Disney Channel movies and things like that. Do you remember as a child, Disney Channel only had Disney commercials between their shows? There you go. They did any outside advertisements, period, between their episodes of any program they had. Do you remember this time frame? Oh, of course. I'm pretty sure they probably still do it now. No, I remember when a shift happened and all of a sudden there was a Capri Sun commercial on Disney. And I was like, wait, there's never been product ads on Disney Channel in my entire life. Yeah. If what I, if what this gentleman is saying is true, do you remember about when that clause was passed? Because this would have been uh, early 2000s, maybe late 90s. Late 90s, I believe. Wow. Yeah, it it it's, it happened right pretty quick, and and they moved on it pretty quick because uh, it was it was a serious thing. And to and to your point, let me, let me I'll throw one more. And yes, Disney would have been their own network, their own fledgling network back in the day, but they wouldn't have been excluded oh, now. Across the way, yeah. With, now, could they have used their influence to kind of push things, you know, fuzz the lines there a little bit nowadays? I mean, nowadays, who, who knows with streaming? But because um, uh, now you can be reclassified as something else. But let me throw another one in for you, which is uh, one of my favorites, um, Bill Nye, the science guy, right? Yeah. Which I'm sure David Nye is, is, or I'm sorry, David Nye, David Weiss has, uh, he's not, a, he's not the son of Bill Nye. The um has uh has railed against many many times, which is I have talked to a number of producers over the years because it always bothered because I'm from where Bill Nye is from. Bill Nye's from Seattle, right? He's an actor from Seattle. He started. He got his bachelor's in mechanical. That's all he's got, guys. Yeah. And then he went straight into acting. And there was a local comedy troupe up in the Northwest called Almost Live, and they it was hosted by uh, Ross Schaefer. Uh, he does game shows and crap like that now. And Ross Shaver was the guy that came up with the idea. He's like, hey, you know, you're tall, angular, you know, you wear a lab coat well, put a bow tie with it. We'll get you to do some science skits, right? And that's what he, he did for this little show called Almost Live. And Disney happened to be looking for some sort of Sesame Street electric company clone. And it's like, well, he doesn't swear. There's nothing controversial about him. Heck, let's, let's, let's sign him to a deal. So they sign him for like a five-year deal. And mm -hmm. he goes on Disney and then people... People don't understand. It's like once you get into syndication, right? Once you're into reruns, you're into reruns for a long time. Why is this important? Because once Bill Nye was established as this science guy, producers grew up with him. And they realized that people with actual PhDs, you know, masters or, you know, in whatever, they're real dry. If you've ever talked to a PhD person that's like a, has a physical science, their wheelhouse becomes so small, they they can't talk out of it. So like you've got them on television. It's like, what, what, what do you think about the, you know, that, that, that particular sciencey thing? And it's like, yes, I agree with it. Right. And then they just stare at the camera and the producers are just like screaming. It's like, get them to talk, get them to talk. So we yeah, built mine. Cause I've so talked go, into the, the shop talking the jargon that they're basically speaking like Cantonese. Yeah. Yeah. And so the, I, cause I always wondered, I go, I, cause I've asked producers, I go, why do you keep inviting Bill Nye? on these things like a, why is he talking about climate change why is he talking about the mars rover why is he doing quantum mechanics the man knows nothing he's a freaking actor right and they say because he looks the part and that's all people care about and it resonates with people that subliminally because they grew up with him it's like oh yeah he used to teach me this, this, this junior high level science stuff so he must be credible now. I mean, the fact that you know he and Obama and Neil Tyson taking selfies together in the White House, it's like, my God, is that what we, you know, we and or or to one more point, which is people again, you, you they miss the the fact that the narrative is narrowed down so much, which is there's only three media scientists in the entire world right now, in the English speaking world. Neil Tyson from the United States, right? Far and away the most popular. Uh Brian Cox from the UK, asshole, and um, uh, Michio Kaku from, from Japan, who happens to know perfect English. I think he, he spent a bu bunch of time over here, and he hates- the old guy with the long white hair? Yeah, that's him. Looks like sort of like a Japanese mad scientist. Yep. 
he yeah. hates conspiracies. He hates anyone that's into conspiracies. In fact, he gets. I love the gentleman, but that's well, fair. You, you wouldn't if you poo-poo. he met <laughs> because if you started rapping about stuff, he you I've seen it where people have interviewed him and you could he can see it on the other side where it's like you you don't believe in that, do you? Right? Where he's looking at the person on the other end, going, you know, whatever conspiracy. He doesn't like any conspiracies at all. But the point is, those three guys are the only guys you put on TV. It's like, really? That's it? It's like, yeah. And so I love throwing into that at physicists because uh, it's like, no, there's there's your high priest right there. There's only three of them. I go, they represent you. It's like, no, they don't. I go, really? Name somebody else. Nobody's ever named anybody else. I love how you mentioned that about Bill Nye and his his background and what he actually has any kind of education in mechanical engineering, which I'm not going to. Eh, no, it's fine, him. but it's a bachelor's in mechanical. No. Right. right. It's, it's sure not a master's. Really good with a calculator because that's what mechanical engineers do. Yeah. Not knocking any mechanical engineers to listen to the show. Love all of you. You're doing important work. I promise someone. Anyway, yes. what I will say is like, okay, just throwing that out. Here's another little brain cooker for anybody out there listening, all the good cult members. Uh, understand that, all right, your basic understanding of science or math or whatever that you learned in school growing up that was reinforced by other teachers and all that. Understand that the vast majority of your teachers had a very basic bachelor's degree in education and barely held a license to be able to teach you the curriculum that the state fed them that they force regurgitated into your brain. Right. So as far as what you were taught and learned, let's really test the source. You know what I mean? Because yep. I, well, I most met people... an English major that was teaching uh, basic chemistry once upon a time. Explain that to me. Right. Well, that's the thing is that most people will, you know, they'll, they'll go around and they'll start regurgitating everything that they learned in high school or middle school. And they look at it as absolute fact. Nobody yeah. looks into actually who wrote those history books or those science books or, or, you know, whatever, anything that could be manipulated. I mean, for the longest time, we, I mean, there's still Columbus day for the longest time. Everybody was looking at Columbus as, oh, he was the really like the first guy here, you know, like I believe that literally until I graduated high school, I thought that he was the first guy right Pluto used to be a planet we were taught that a place that we will never go have never been to and i've never fucking seen right. apparently used to be a thing that it's no longer and that's a big deal again well, i still we're, have- we're never going to go to any planet let's just get that let's just get that right no and no no and by the way the the mars program which i love so much uh you know because they the, otherwise known as the orion program they they keep talking about it like it's a done deal Right. So it's all, you know, this is what we're going to do. We're getting that, you know, cart before the horse. It's like, oh, we got all these plans. What we're going to do. It's like, what are you talking about? Even it's even if you could get there, it's a one way trip. You're never leaving. Right. Even if you could pull it off. But that's a whole nother whole nother thing. I could I could spend a lot of time on in that one. You know, like so the, I wanted, to, yeah, I wanted you know, to ask, Mark, you were talking about how um you were and this is right up my alley. So whenever you said it, I was like, all right, I got to keep that in the bank. What? believe that there could be alternate realities alternate timelines maybe alternate alternate dimensions how did you come across that belief and i'm right there with you but i kind of understood that through psychedelics personally uh Uh, yeah i could make up something clever and say well i mixed a whole bunch of peyote with some angel dust no um (laughs) No, no, I, I didn't do any of that. Uh, it was because I, I grew up in the, the video game world. And by that, you know, I, I played video games professionally and I was in the video game production scene to where, and all my friends were super high, high geek guys. You know, I, I some of my friends were some of the finest gamers in the world, um, in my opinion. And when you do that, if you spend enough time with those people, you start to look at a lot of sci-fi concepts. You know, uh, you know, little things like the the Matrix. By the way, which Matrix turned twenty five years old this year. Oh my God, I'm getting old. Damn, I know, right? Uh, or the Thirteenth Floor, or World on a Wire, or uh, Simulacron Three, which is a book which really started the whole thing. Um, but or you know, or or sci fi things like The Man in the High Castle. Uh, I love alternate timelines. I I love time travel in general, but alternate sci-fi? timelines and potential alternate realities have always been intriguing for me once I got into uh, simulation theory. Uh, and and by the way, that is one of the things I've always been into, but I can't, when, like, so when I talk about flat earth, right, you know, it's mostly because 
that's the the lowest common denominator term that I can throw at people. The average person has a hard time even getting past those two words. Uh, from the video game world, the reason why, the reason I mention it is because when we build games, I don't care if it's GTA or Minecraft or Warcraft or uh, whatever it is that's out there. Um, it is they're all built on on flat flat plains. I mean, yeah, there's hills and valleys, but the end the ends line up. And everything's squared off, by the way. There are no circles. Computers can't can't draw circles or spheres. It's illusions. Um, you know, pixels are square for a reason. All engineering is it's everything's based on right angles, right? It's just the back. You guys, if you're old enough to remember the old Ataris from back in the day, right? Everything was super, super blocky. And which and and it's like, so once they advanced, it's like, oh, thank God we got out of the Atari era, which is why when Minecraft came out, I was just appalled. It's like, yeah, there's 100 million kids playing Minecraft out there. It's like, why? It's horrible resolution, deliberately, right? The del in fact, if I had to go back in time, sorry, a little side note, I would, one of the first things I would do is I would call the, the head of Lego and I would have them go over to Sweden or wherever that guy's from that made it and just buy them out, just back up a truck money because Lego, oh my God, they could have run with that thing forever because it's basically, it's, it's almost copyright infringement. It's uh, digital Lego. Yeah, it is. It's digital Lego. That's all it really is. And and they were just lucky that they didn't include the little pegs on top and the openings on the bottom. Um, but when it comes to simulation theory, uh, I've always been a big fan because uh, of two two quick experiments which scream that this place is a simulation. And I and if you don't want to talk, you know, the different sci-fi shows have talked about this over the years. But um, one, of course, is the double slit experiment which is something that you were probably told when you were young, but like me, didn't understand it, which is if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to hear it, does it actually make a sound? And of course, when you're a kid, you're trying to wrap your head around that. It's like, what, what does it mean? What does it mean? What do, you mean? what do you mean there has to be an observer? I had no freaking idea until I started getting into um, computer simulations. And it's like, wait a minute. We're doing that in computer simulations deliberately, and we do it every time. And it's exactly what the double slit experiment. But the thing is, why are we doing that now when the double slit experiment is very, very old? It's an old physics experiment. It's been it, way back before the electron stuff. They were doing it with with water and ping pong balls or whatever those balls were back in the day. And what it basically says is, for people that don't know, in the video game world, we have something that's called flashlight graphics. And we'll get into the alternate timeline things in, in a second. Flashlight graphics, meaning whatever you're looking at in a video game, we're rendering it completely as maximized as we can because you're looking at it. Whatever you're not looking at, we're not doing crap to it. It's just a blob if it's even lit at all. As a matter of fact, it's probably just rough shapes if it's to your left or your right or your peripheral vision. And if it's behind you or in the next room, it doesn't exist at all. The question is, why is that happening here? Meaning, well, it, you know, why why is that why is that happening at all? It, it you know, it's meaning it happens in our world as well, which is what kind of the um uh the movie The Thirteenth Floor was based off of, which is if it, I firmly believe that if you know, because all companies, all tech companies are trying so desperately to create a, a VR simulation where you can just jack in. Like, like the Matrix, they, they're having a devil of time. They can't do it because you have to hook up the other three senses. You know, it's not just sight and sound. It's the other three that you would have to do it some sort of surgically and it's a pain in the ass. I mean, come on, the Matrix from a, from a healthcare insurance standpoint, it, you can never pull it off. You know, no health insurance, whatever, you know, whatever allow you to jack into your own brain. Sort of like right. the, um, uh, the Purge movies, right? Purge movies, great idea as a concept. They right? blow it off some steam, kill a bunch of people, right? Except people, it's like, no, the insurance nightmare. You know, people, there'd be a lot of people out there, which is unrealistic in the movies. We just start setting fires. Are you kidding? Oh, my God. Just cans of gas and road flares. Just start burning everything freaking down. The city, there'd be no city in 24 hours. Yeah, but that's an easy fix. Make sure the insurance companies let them know any damage incurred on purge night is not covered. Uh, well, yes. Yeah. It, then it gets, uh, as you know, then it gets tricky because there's corporations oh, no, like, yeah, but our true. building's next to this building and we don't want, it would be a firestorm. It would be a pain in the ass for sure. Oh, it'd be horrible. But I like, I, heck, I love the, the, the concept. And in fact, how many, where are we up to? Purge four, purge five, something like that. It's ridiculous. I don't even know if they're using numbers or just whole words at this point. I right. don't even know. Right. <laughs> purge, keep going, purge forever. Um, <laughs> 
the uh i mean it, it really gave it was cathartic for a bunch of people i know that sure. i know there's people it's like oh man that'd be a great idea so the other <laughs> thing uh, besides I'm gonna be honest i was one of those guys who were like look this is not the worst idea i've ever heard I, I mean, I mean i'm not for it i'm not for people murdering other people in cold blood and like all the horrible atrocities that be committed i'm not right but but, but you know, and the the more movies they did, it more it got fleshed out. It's like, yeah, it wouldn't exactly be fair. It would be it, about five years, and then like you could take it away. And I don't know. I don't know. I'm just yeah. saying. I'm not saying, but I'm just saying. You know. I hear you. Um, the yeah. other thing that people have to look at, and and a lot of people, a lot of people know the double slit experiment. The other people, the experiment that most people don't know is called um, neuroscience and free will. There's a wiki page on this. Where some scientists, because again, American scientists get bored and they just do stuff, hook up a bunch of electrodes to a person's brain, they put them on a computer, and then they they set a little timer and they say, okay, hit a number between one and nine, right? And note the, the we're going to monitor your brain, but note the, the, the timer. It's going to be in seconds and tenths of seconds, right? So you're going to pick a number, right? Between one and nine, right? And when you pick it, also note if there was any gap between the time you decided what the number was, let's say four, right? And the time you actually hit the four key. And for most people, it's like, I'm going to pick, you know, it's instantaneous. I'm going to pick five, right? And they click five. This is where it gets weird. The computer knew that you had already committed to a number eight seconds before you hit the key. Every time. And that freaked a whole bunch of scientists out. Uh, I'll give you the, the the hundredth monkey effect too after this, which is that freaked people out because then it got into um, uh, a predestination type scenario, which scientists absolutely hate, which is, no, 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 your life's already been mapped out. Free will is only because you don't know the choices you made ahead of time, which by the way, was hinted in the second matrix which glossed over, which is like where he was like, I can't make that decision, you know, to kill Trinity, right? I can't make the decision. He goes, you don't have to make that decision. You already made it. You're just here to understand why you made it, right? <laughs> and what, I, what I'm getting at is this. You want the predestination thing? It gets even weirder than that. Imagine this. Does it make sense from a design standpoint? If you believe in simulation theory and why we're here, there are a bunch of kids out there. I'm not poking at you guys if you do it. But there's a bunch of kids that don't even play video games on their own. They watch YouTube videos of other kids playing video games. They That's my dog all free, day. Yeah, they don't even pick up a controller. That's And the reason why is because they get chemically, electrochemically, almost the same experience as playing it themselves. Like anxiety, you know, a little frustration here and there. And what you don't get is when you're watching that, right? Let's say it's not you're watching. A, you're not watching a live stream. Watch a pre-record, right? There's no servers happening. There's no interactive thing happening. You're just watching an MP4 video that was recorded days or weeks or even months ago, right? But you're getting almost the same experience. So, and that's a huge reduction in resources. That's less than 1% of the resources of actually doing it in real time yourself. You know, you don't need massive service. All you need is a stupid little, little video file. So who's to say that you're not living... Again, if this was a simulation, who's saying you're not living in an interactive real-time simulation? You're living in a pre-record that you made all the decisions ahead of time, which would sort of make sense because why? kind of like with the, the flashlight graphics, why would you burn up so many resources when you get the same? All you have to do is put a memory block before you get here, but you make all the, the, the basic decisions ahead of time. So, and then use macros for the rest of them. So it's like, okay, this is where, you know, my life starts and I break my arm here and I go skiing here and I meet this girl and I get married and have kids and here's my career. And then the rest of it fills in yourself. Like you don't have to put in, you know, I brushed my teeth 16,000 times, you know, in this, you know, you don't have to, that'll just fill it automatically with some, with some variances. So the predestination thing really, really got me because it's like, oh yeah. And again, the scientist is just like, just trying to throw it away. It's like what you discovered it we didn't discover it so why are you why are you trying to deny it sort of like let me throw one more out you, which is the uh, 100th monkey effect you ever heard of it yeah oh yeah 100 monkey effect love it for those listeners who never heard of it uh scientists again bored it's like we're, we're gonna throw potatoes to monkeys on a on a some japanese islands right because we gotta do something with japanese islands 
and they uh, they 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 realize the monkeys ate more potatoes if they washed the, the sand off because they throw them on the beach right and they get sand on them and the monkeys would wash them. a couple of them would figure out that they would wa if they washed the sand off they, they they tasted better you know nobody likes to eat sand what got weird was when they reached about the hundredth monkey give or take there was an automatic update to all the rest of the monkeys, not only on that island, but the islands that they hadn't even gotten to the potatoes yet. So when they went over to another island, which is the first the monkeys couldn't have possibly swum over there and taught them, they get over there, they throw it, it's like they instantly all knew. And it's like, oh yeah, beneficial update, a hot fix. Of course. Why why wouldn't you have that? I mean, that that screams software. Uh, you know, intuitive software that, that's automatically like, yeah, why why not benefit the monkeys? You know, it, it seems like a good idea. Sure, why why the heck not? So let me ask you this. I Talk think it's actually it within is. our nature, though. Oh, I'm sorry, Jacob. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I, this is kind of in line with what you're saying here. So you believe in flat Earth in the same realm that you believe in simulation or matrix theory or something akin to this. I'm not sure exactly what you call it, but I understand what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. That, all those words are good. Now, all of that to say that implies a creator yes. or a designer or yes. a programmer, if you yep. will. So, I, I don't know what your comfort level is as far as uh, religion goes, or if you even believe that that's even a talking point. If we're talking no, about no, no, it uh, is. No, we can we can use it. Things. What's your personal stance on all of that? God is a programmer, um, and why wouldn't he be he or she or whatever? We'll just say God. The God sure. God is a programmer. But let's say he. It's used so many times in other things, but in the beginning there was the word, right? Well, right. I was in the word, the code. Right. You know, when when you talk about the, uh, you know, then there was light and everything was being built. Again, I come from the, the game creation life. So I remember I'm old enough to remember the early games, the, 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 the stories that like the myths, by the way, back in the day when the sun and the moon weren't even in the sky, there was just light and dark. If you remember the old video games, that was the same what we did with with our games. We didn't have the sun and the moon in the sky. The sky just got lighter and it got darker. And then eventually we added the sun and the moon. And eventually we had the sun and the moon do things. Like the sun would be in the sky in the early simulations, but it didn't affect anything. It was just decoration. And the same right. thing with the stars and, and everything else. Most of the stuff is, is just decoration. Um, but yes, you're absolutely right. Um, there is, I'll give you some stats really quick. Uh, half of our members in our community in the flower community at least half are at least in the united states are strong christians to the point where before the whole pandemic thing happened there were flat earth biblical conferences that i wasn't even allowed to go to because i couldn't quote enough chapter and verse now, i can quote some occasional chapter and verse right i'm not going to say i can you know lead a, a baptist funeral or anything like that but i can i can hold my own but I couldn't even I couldn't even do that. And the reason was there was a lot of people there, and I heard this from a number of the, the speakers there. They said that flat earth slash simulation slash enclosed world, whatever you want to call it, leaned people get it gave people the extra percentage points towards a creator that they didn't have. So if they were like 93% belief in a creator, a simulation or flat earth, whatever, took them to 98%. That's all, that's huge, right? That, 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 so there were so many people that came back to the church because of it. Me personally, I, I was raised um, born again Christian, you know, uh, church wasn't just a Sunday thing, you know, a vacation Bible school and summer camp and Camp Malibu and, and stuff like that, youth group and stuff like that. But when I got into tech in the gaming world, I fell away from that because you can't, you can't hang around with nerds. Nerds don't, don't go to church. They just don't. Saturdays they go to the comic book shop and Sundays they'll they'll go watch movies or something like that or play Magic the Gathering, which we did. Oh well, man, you're that you're that type of nerd. Oh, you're I was that guy. Real nerd. Was, well, and it, well, it was through osmosis that I was I was actually the cooler kid of of the bit. I mean, I hung out with some what's the line from the movie? I was hung out with some Neo Maxi Zoom dweebies. Oh yeah. Oh, These were guys that absolutely a little bit with that one, brother. I hate to tell you. Was that a yeah. fast time through? Uh, or no, no, no. That was a Ferris Bueller's Day Off, wasn't it? Nope, nope. That was uh, Breakfast Club. Oh, damn it! That All was right. when he was uh, making. That was when he was making fun of Anthony Michael Hall, who ended up getting jacked and huge later, so he couldn't play nerd anymore. Go figure. Um, he yeah. ended up playing the jock in um, Edward Scissorhands, and it's like, ooh, his roles are going to be limited. 
I didn't see him as the jock. I'm sorry. Even in Edward Scissorhands, even when he was the the asshole boyfriend who was just down in the whiskey and seen as the bad kid, I could only see him as the nerd who was I drunk, know. I the know. tough guy. I'm I sorry. Know. But but it's, because of that, I because of all because of all the nerd stuff I did, and I did a lot of nerd stuff. Um, I mean, land parties back in the day was awesome. The um and I, you know, I went to video game conferences on top of it, you know, uh, Macworld Boston, Macworld San Fran, E3, and stuff like that. I was a game, I was a game ringer, by the way. That's how I was hired to go to conferences and make games look better than they were. But because of that, uh, religion was no not a part of me at all. However, when I got into again, we're just gonna call it flat earth because it's quicker. Um, when I got into the whole flat earth thing or created world, uh, that changed for me. Now I don't go to church. I still don't go to church, right? And I still hate funerals and weddings just because various reasons. Fair. But but, but I have but spirituality now is much, much more important to me. I respect the major five religions, um, Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. I respect all of them because come on, they each got about a billion people. They've got a whole bunch of influence over the world. They control 80% of the population. But something changed in me to where I realized there's there's there seems to be something else to this world meaning if you if there is a creator and you realize there's a creator not guess there's a creator have faith in a creator but you know there's a creator i think the rules are then different for you and i'll give you a quick example um the apollo astronauts for you know and i can't remember if david ever brought this up but i i thought it was pretty good i can't remember if i put it in my clues or not i probably should remember those which was there was a, a guy named bart sabrell ass real abrasive guy but he challenged the moon missions he did a, a thing a, a movie called a funny thing on the way that happened on the way to the moon which was actually pretty good but as a follow-up to it he would go around to the surviving apollo astronauts and this was back when i think there were seven or eight of them and he would ask them to put their hand on the bible and just do a quick swear it's like swear you went to the moon that's all he wanted i remember right? seeing these videos yeah 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 and they were so terrified of that book or it wasn't even the book. It was the idea of it. Meaning, the, and it's like, come on. It's like, come on. People lie in court all the time. It's called perjury, right? People do it all day long. Every hour, every day, people people lie under oath. But they weren't, and this wasn't even technically under oath, right? This wasn't a court thing. It was just, oh, put your hand on the Bible right there. So, you know, say you went to the moon. None of them would do it. None of them would even come close. It's like they treated it like it was, like it was made out of um, radioactive material. And... It kind of dawned on me when when that was happening. It's like, oh yeah, if you know, you're not going to take that chance, are you? Because if if you know there is a God, if there is a Creator, right, and this God is is watching you, and I and maybe not hovering over you, but you know, parents, you know, looking over the top of a newspaper from the couch, you know, to make sure the kid's not sticking a penny in a light socket type thing. Right, right. If if that's the case, are you willing to roll those dice? and and lie knowing the parents watching they wouldn't and for me and, and we can segue to something else if you want but this will sort of answer your question i decided then and there that i'll never do a malicious thing to anyone ever again in my life because if it's premeditated if it's malicious that means i know and i'm ignoring it anyway and you know what my life's been pretty good ever since then uh you know it's 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 now there's no guarantees of course one of the the arguments people say it's like oh one of the common questions that people say well if you ever met god and lisa simpson of course was emphasized this which was why do you let bad things happen to good people right that's why it's like why why do you let bad things happen it's like to like ned why do bad things happen to ned flanders sometimes it's like well it can't be an absolute because if it's an absolute people will exploit it people will figure it out and it's like, oh, all I have to do is help little old ladies cross the street and then good things will happen to me. Nothing bad. Will... It's like, no, people, you, you have to make random things happen that create doubt to where the free will thing kicks in. It's still got to be your choice. You can't make it absolute. Otherwise, you know, people will, you know, somebody does something really horrible and the lightning strikes them a week later. How many, how, you know, how many bad people are you going to get? So right. I won't. I won't do anything malicious. So when people um, ask me, it's like, you know, why do you, you know, not get mad at interviews, no matter what, you know, who swears at you and, and who does things? It's like, what, be, how could I? It's hypocritical, 
right? You know, not only it's, there's two things happening. One, I, you know, it's like, look, I was them 10 years ago. I was in their camp. It's like, I can't yell at them. I was in their same camp. I would have laughed you out of the room too. Uh, but the other part is like how I can't know. I mean, I mean, yeah, I'll, I'll get upset and I'll defend myself to a certain degree. Sure. It's not like someone could come in with a home invasion and they're not going to, you know, end up with lead and, you know, right. fall. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. They're not going to fall on six or seven bullets. Right, but, right. But, and land on six or seven bullets. But at the same time, I'm not going to counterattack, you know, the average person that, that's, that's talking about, you know, that wants to argue with me about whatever it is, you know, my opinion. Do you so, believe in a creator? I do. A programmer, and yeah. you apply a basic do no harm karma realm to your everyday life. Yes, I can get down with this. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, it. I mean, it. It works for me. And again, there. It, once again, once it. Once it happened. Once I realized, it's like, oh my, you know, this. The you know, all the world Shakespeare. All the world's truly a stage, and and we're just players in it. Once I embraced that yeah there was there was new it's like okay well i'm not going to be a deliberate villain i'm not going to be an asshole all the time you know and so which is why i i laugh at trolls and oh by the way one more one more thing along those lines um i believe in npcs if this world is simulated i absolutely believe again coming from the gaming world people forget that even before the first player steps forward and i'm not stealing from free guy that i learned about this a long time ago you populate the world with NPCs first to make sure the world runs okay without any external forces, right? And the NPCs can can do, you know, basically, you know, they, they go about their daily lives, but they're just background noise. So, you know, do I think there's a lot of people, again, why would you have a massively interactive game that, uh, that where everyone is interactive? No, that's not how it would work. We, I think, believe it. Art imitates life, and we've we've kind of taken, you know, we we've stolen from what happens out in the world inadvertently. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, even oh. Adam and Eve weren't the first two people here, right? right? Like even the even the right. Bible admits that, right? Um, but oh, it's yeah. just the first two people that got the spotlight, really. Oh, I'll yeah. I'll even I'll even go a step like further that. than that. I'll 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 go a step further than that, which was something I wrote to somebody recently. Where and I don't tell a lot of people this, but I'll tell you guys why the hell not. Of course, if I die of a stroke, make sure you get this out there. The, that. Um, which is, um, I believe that not only are there randomized NPCs, but I believe that. I believe in capital G, you know, the, the God that controls everything. But I also believe that because this world isn't a one-off, because why would it be, right? There should be probably a whole bunch of different worlds in different stages that there are deities, I call them small Gs, that more or less are also randomized so that not only do you have a randomized worlds in different stages of progress, but the deity that controls it also has some sort of leeway. When it comes to certain things and yeah, come on the 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 old testament if you believe in that uh kind of reads there's a lot of times where it reads like it's some child temper tantrums happening right where there's there's a lot some pretty severe things that are happening i don't like the way that's going on bam 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 and you know and things get smushed um there's a, there's a read, oh, no doubt and i got a i got a reference for you for that one which is um uh, one of the the highest rated Twilight Zone episodes of all, of all time, I think it was early, late 1950s, was called "It's a Good Life." Not to be confused with "It's a Wonderful Life." Look up one a, of my a character's Christmas movies. I might add the what? I said one of my favorite Christmas movies. Oh my god, it's wonderful, and it did terrible when it first came out. By the way, did not do well because it came out right after the war, and people are like, "Yeah, it's too soon." Yeah, you boy would deal with PTSD during yeah, pe people are still that. suffering a lot from the war. It's a wonderful life. Yeah, yeah, not gonna it, but whatever. It, yeah, it's now a timeless classic. But it's a good life was about a kid. And boy, this is way before the whole WandaVision thing. I mean, decades and decades before WandaVision, where there was a kid that was born with godlike powers. He could manipulate matter and anything he wanted to do. But the problem was he was freaking nine. Right. <laughs> By the time his powers were realized and he was acting like a nine-year-old kid with godlike powers right he was doing all sorts of horrible things but he was doing just selfish kid things i mean instinctual things right the television only played dinosaurs crashing into each other which was, i thought was interesting is of course because he'd be in a sandbox otherwise crashing dinosaurs into each other which which was <laughs> what he would do 
and he only right. wanted certain foods and he only wanted certain things to happen. And I was thinking, and and for me, once the show ended, because it ended like all Twilight Zone episodes, it's like, oh, that poor town. Because <laughs> he sealed off the town. He completely right. built a barrier around the town and nobody could leave. They were just subject to his whim and it was awful. But imagine when he got older and he matured, how that would evolve into something else. And I thought, yeah, why wouldn't you do that in a certain way? You could do that with a deity as well, which is as a deity got older, it would also get more advanced and, and come up with different different concepts and, of course, follow some sort of grand plan. But but do things, you know, th there would be some variations. You know, always bugged me. Sorry, one, one quick side note on that. It always bugged me, the, the story of Job and how he was trolling God. And, you know, trolling the God of this world, which I call a sandbox God. And I'm not, no disrespect, no disrespect at all. You understand what I mean when I say sandbox God. Right. right. It's covering my ass there. So where Job was trolling, you know, God criticizing some of his de design techniques, right? And there was this line that God was throwing at Job, you know, which is, you, you've heard this line before. It's used by all men over a period of time. It's like, it's like, you know, where God, God was saying, where were you when I laid the foundations? You know, where were you when I did this? It's like, which is the, the standard line, which men use. It's like, I was doing your job when you were just, a, you know, how, who yeah. are you to criticize me? When you were just a twinkle in your daddy's eye, I was running the railroads and stuff like that. That's what yeah, God yeah, was yeah. doing to Job. The question is, why was Job even being allowed to take it that far? Why was God even throwing that lecture out there? He should Well, keep in mind. The book of Job is understood to be a parable these days. I, I get it. Yeah. I get it. But it was it was an interesting what, what I was getting at was I think that that uh, that God, this particular God, the sandbox God that runs this place has evolved over time. And okay. all the stuff that used to be, you know, very severe isn't as much. Of course, we're getting I still believe we're getting to some sort of act three where there's a lot of stuff that's coming down the pipe. I've been looking forward to 2024 for a while now. Uh, I was a big believer in 2012 back in the day. Oh, yeah. So disappointed. Oh, then let me ask you this. What? There's a new study that shows that the Mayan calendar, we thought it was going to be December of 2012. Come to find out, it's more like 2026, 20, 2027. 20, Their math is a little different than ours. There are star charts, and if you account for that, apparently now the experts are saying that the Mayan calendar ended then. Now, that being said... The Mayan calendar is cyclical, meaning that at the end of that, it just starts over at day one and repeats itself. Hmm. But they're saying that the new end date is allegedly supposed to be 2026 or 2027, depending. For me, unfortunately, I am now jaded because I bought in. I mean, you know, the, the movie with John Cusack, 2012, came out in 2009. And I remember, I mean, I was into it. I mean, I'd heard the stories like, oh, no, it's going to happen in 2011. It's going to happen a year early. Then I heard 2013, a year late. And then as the years went by, I'm like, I, I have joked over the years. I've said, you know, if then the whole Nibiru, you know, the, the Planet X thing, which I loved uh, Melancholia. I love that movie. Uh, it, it's tough to watch the the first half of it. If you can just skip to the second half, you're, you're good. But if Nibiru, sh let's put it this way. If Nibiru all of a sudden shows up in this freaking sky, right? Where other people will be hands in the air screaming, I'll be like, where have you been? <laughs> it's about damn time. I've been, I've been waiting a long time, my guy. And uh, so, no, and by the way, when, when you believe in some uh, a simulation and, uh, and the whole flat earth thing, all the, all the sky terrors go away because you don't, um, uh, because again, for me, everything that's in the sky is just part of a very highly ornamental clock system that predates language. That's, that's basically it. So, and again, why wouldn't you have a clock system like that? And again, why wouldn't God create a massive clock system that you don't need a language for? You can do all your crops and all your signs and wonders. And then you start, then you start making cool little decorations. I thought it was a little over the top to decorate the moon. Because the way it's decorated doesn't make sense in that the, you know, the craters are set at 90 degree angles and there's a whole bunch of them and they're huge. And it's like, okay, why would they come in at 90 degree angles? Why wouldn't the gravity, quote unquote, gravity of the earth affect those? Why is it locked to where we don't even see a, deg a half a degree of turn? And in, in That's what I'm saying. Hold on. What, what do you mean it's over the top? I think it's lazy. 
didn't even design the other half of it, bro. You got it. By, by the way, good. You know what? Gold star, because no one brings that up. The dark side of the moon is, is you're right. There's like, oh, wow, that's unremarkable. <laughs> yeah, there's it's like, wow, that's there's no. I mean, yeah, you're right. The good side. Yeah, we have the good side. Yeah, yeah good. Oh, I mean, point. whenever you're talking about simulation, wouldn't the, the dark side of the moon just be unrendered? Yeah, yeah. No doubt. Well, unrendered, except that eventually someone is either going to fake it or come up with something else to where, like, well, yeah, you're right. If it is unrendered, well, okay, that's another great point. If it is truly unrendered, then whatever we're showing people is absolutely fake. You know, they're just making up crap, which is probably why they made it so generic so that people um, wouldn't even make note of it. It's like, oh, hey, what's that cool creator? Hey, what's that? They made it so bland. Oh, sorry. Another thing real fast, which is Artemis, you know, the Artemis program. When Artemis won, you know, did their, their freaking flyby. Yeah. Oh, my God. So disappointed. You know, they're 50 miles. They're 50 miles supposedly away from the moon. And the resolution is abysmal. It's absolutely terrible. And it's like. My God, I mean, we can take better shots from here. These guys are literally point blank range away. That and of course, you know, no stars ever with with multiple cameras. If you combine them up, hundreds of hours of footage and there's no stars in space. Like, OK, fine. I, again, I, I know I realize that people have given me, which is why I don't I don't let them dig in too much when they uh, say, oh, well, there are no stars from the Apollo missions because uh, because of the exposure setting. It's like, yeah, but it's 2023. Well, now it's 2024. Our cameras, I will say this, out of all the future things we didn't get, you know, we didn't get flying cars, we didn't get uh, robot servants, and we didn't get ray guns, but we got really good communication. You know, the, the phones, I mean, come on, the Swiss Army knife of the gods, these things are. Yeah, oh, yeah. No doubt. And, and camera technology is really, really good. However, apparently that same camera technology can't can't capture stars. And by the way, those people are listening. It's like, well, the exposure say it's like, no, it, the reason why uh, you, you don't show stars on the moon, and I got this, was because uh, the constellations back in the 1960 would have been too tough to line up. Uh, I mean, it, that is a nerd nightmare right there. And so somebody just came up with like, you know, it's like, well, you know, the belt of Orion should be over here during this timestamp. And and some 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 head guy at the end of the table. There's always one guy at the end of the table that says, nope, just just freaking kill the stars. No one's gonna, no one's gonna even care. So they didn't. And it was I mean, good. and technically, I mean, if you're going up in a space shuttle to the moon or just going into orbit or whatever, you're closer to the stars. Why wouldn't they at least be a little bit bigger Dude, from, from that I, perception, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely right. Oh, hell, if you're going to that line, um, why don't we have shuttles anymore? Why, why they just discontinue that crap or the space race, which I love. You know, you can look it up. But they're easy, it's easy to find. Type in um, U.S. Soviet space race and and uh, click on images. You'll see all the Time magazine covers. You know, cosmonauts. That was a thing, by the way. Cosmonauts, cosmonauts yeah. and astronauts. You know, racing towards the moon. All this wonderful artistry. And then again, first time in the history of sports where the the first people supposedly get to the moon, the Americans. And then nobody goes back. And then the Russians quit. They're just like, oh no, we're, that's it. We're done. It's like. What? what are you talking about? They just folded up the tent, but I got it. I totally got it. when you get in when you get into you know flatter simulation stuff, you get it because you realize we know now, you know, because we, we're so much, you know, the United States is so much into movies, the production studio continuity has to be perfect. And we have some how many, how many websites are out there? Moviemistakes.com. If a coffee cup freaking moves from this side of the room to that side of the room and the character doesn't move it someone's going to freaking blog about it or do whatever. They're going to make a video about it, right? The internet is going to be the internet about it, 1,000%. They, they will lose it. I mean, people forget. And it's like, well, you know, if you have so much money, you know, like a, like a space program, you're not going to make those sort of mistakes. It's like, oh, really? Look into the first Hobbit movie, the very first one, right? You know, Fellowship of the Ring. The, the, the first theater cut, when the Hobbits are leaving the Shire, there's a road in the upper right corner where a white car is driving through. And people were just like, and nobody caught it. Imagine that. You went through all the edits, all the the, the different stu studio audience testing, and nobody saw it because they were focused on the hobbits. One guy gets bored, loses his popcorn or whatever, raises his head in a theater. It's like, what's that car doing there, right? They had to pull all those prints and recut that particular thing. So don't think for a second that production mistakes can't be made. So what I'm getting at is, so you have the United States and the Russians, Soviet Union at the time, 
making they're both making their their space prod you know their their space films for lack of a better term somebody realizes it's like well here's the deal we couldn't if if uh if one studio if you had two studios next to each other in los angeles but they were only like a mile apart and they were trying to shoot the same scene chances of them being 100 percent in line are impossible damn near impossible but you're saying we're going to have one in an air force base in nevada i don't know where could be anywhere and the other one at a at a studio in moscow those two are never, I mean, because all it takes is that point, because what'll happen, here's here's what would happen. You'd be thinking, oh, no one, the Russians had to defer to us. We probably paid them or, you know, told them, it's like, look, we'll take it from here. Because of the Russians, all of a sudden, oh, look, we have cosmonauts on moon, right? And then all of a sudden, somebody's watching, it's like, why does their ash look so much browner than ours, right? And the, sorry, one more thing along those lines, where if you remember, there was a, a Rammstein video, I'm sure David's told you about it. Uh, called um, "We're All Living in America." I love done... the band, and I love that song. It's a great, it's a great song. It's a great video. But the Germans knew, and that particular director, he was absolutely a conspiracy guy. And all they did was they they rented a, a, a an abandoned factory, this queened all the walls out, and made sure, and then put in you know tons of ash, perfect gray ash, and they got the color palette perfectly. To where you're looking at this and you're like, wow, it is really easy to do to replicate what the Americans did, which is why they've been kicking the can down the road for 50 years. I mean, remember the Artemis, the the next Artemis mission's already been kicked down the road till September of 25. Okay? You know and what's it's, crazy? It's like, you're right. You said Moscow and Nevada don't look very similar, but you know what? Russia also had all of Siberia to shoot from. They could have set up a whole outdoor production in a blizzard. And said that they landed and the moon's really cold because it's in outer space and it's cold as fuck out there. Yeah. And if they would have put that out first and that was the official news that went out, who would have questioned them? Yeah, who would have questioned it? Absolutely. Have y'all People... seen the uh, the video footage from the quote-unquote India moon landing here recently? Oh, dude, yeah, it don't. Is some of the most laughable things. You, hey. it's, it's it's hilarious. I'm, I actually have it pulled up. And they did um, it for, yeah. And now... No, making their tracks on the moon bro what you talking that ain't fake That's now, real. now granted now granted this is a computer simulation but at the same time this is what you know this is what they put out there this is what they showed their people they didn't show them actual footage they showed them this and they supposedly did it oh, for is that true i didn't know that i thought this was the actual footage no 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 no. there was no that's just it there was no actual footage this right is, but this is what they again this is what they showed their people it's like oh look we landed a thing on the moon and this is our proof it's like what are you talking about? This is just a, a freaking. It's this is a video game from 1996. This and they're all horrible. clapping. They're all cheering. Yeah, they're all they're all cheering. And yeah, <laughs> I I saw that that was they, and they supposedly did it real. Was the rover once it got on the surface? But all of it about it landing and touching down, the Indian people losing their shit at the TV screens was a fucking CGI video, bro. Yeah, yeah. Again, that the there is a line which I love so much from the 1998. Um, Truman Show movie, which is it's I mean, they didn't write it. It was stolen from everybody else. It might as well have been from Plato's cave, which is people believe the world that is presented to them. We don't like to believe in lies, especially if they're really, really big. And so why wouldn't you believe in it? Look, people defer to authority all the time. I did a, a later clue called the uh, Code of Credibility. No, well, it was it was the Code of Credibility, but it was um. Also tied, well, yeah, it was credibility, which was that whoever's wearing a lab coat, people immediately think they're more intelligent than they are. And we prove this by just going on the street. Like, so, like, we sent people down to Los Angeles, like, you know, whatever corner of busy intersections down there. And normally, if they went down there and tried to hand out flyers, you're not going to get much traction. All they had to do was put on a lab coat and a clipboard. People just walked up to them. They didn't even have to ask. People just, hey, what are you, you know, what are you doing, smart person? <laughs> and and they they would engage with them for for whatever it was. So uh, who yeah, the hell would, who the hell would even be wearing a lab coat out on a fucking street in the first place? Nobody even thought to ask that. Right, right. Why, 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 why would they? But yet they still thought. Again, people do it all the time. I I have heard this argument. Well. I understand your point, but I'm going to go with people that, that, you know, have their PhDs and, and whatever, or, you know, even worse people that, you know, like my grandfather worked for NASA. It's like, Oh God, you know, 
it, which is fine. The only guy I didn't, I gave a pass to, it, he was actually literally my next door neighbor when I was in Boulder for a while. Um, his name was Wayne Ottinger. In fact, you could, you could if you pull him up, um, if you type in Wayne Ottinger, O-T-T-I-N-G-E-R, and click on images, he was the garage mechanic for NASA. I mean, he was the guy, right? And he, by the time I met him, he was got to have been like 81. You'll see him like with glasses and white hair standing between like Neil Armstrong and, and somebody else. There's a famous picture of those three together. He was the guy that invented the, um, let me see. Uh, yeah, that's him. That's yeah, it's him right there in the the red shirt, and that's him also there with some of the astronauts. Yeah, he's the, he's the guy with the um the the light blue shirt with the thing in the middle. Yeah, that's yep. Wayne. Pretty sure he's dead now. He's got to be dead. Either that or he's ninety. I, mean, I would assume. If not, the man's yeah. But then, then, he's he's up there in the um in that red plaid shirt up in the corner. But anyway, he was the garage mechanic. So he was the guy. He made a he wrote a book. In fact, there's the book. Wait a minute, stop. There's a there's a that book called unconventional contrary and ugly he wrote that book okay right there that is the the lander for the moon that's what they trained on it's a convertible right because with an ejection seat so they could eject that's supposedly what they tested right people again the, the average person doesn't know this the lander which you see in the moon you know the apollo missions right they know that thing that looks like a like a homeless tweakers shelter that thing was never tested ever Never. It was really? never tested. It was tested live for the first time on the moon, and it absolutely worked. This thing, the unconventional, contrary, and ugly, I actually have a copy of this book that he signed for me. Uh, that that machine crashed multiple times. In fact, there's a famous story of John Glenn where, you know, Wayne's got a piece of the broken seatbelt where he barely got out at the last second. I mean, you imagine trying to fly that thing like a helicopter, right, with that single engine and, like, almost no thrusters on the side? So how did you get this thing to work on the moon in one sixth Earth's gravity with a complete canopy? It's not even remotely close to this. Don't know. No one will talk about it. No one will. No one will say. Is there any footage of the the actual lander being tested on the on here? Nope, there isn't. But yeah. Anyway, oh, so the point was this guy who was living next to me. I remember going over to uh, you know because I had to look after his cat every once in a while, and um, when he was gone doing you know seminars about the moon. And he and his walls were just bristling with plaques, like lifetime achievement plaques. You can imagine you got a plaque every freaking year. He, he did something right. And he like had all the astronauts on speed dial and all that stuff. And people say, well, why didn't you hit him with the whole, you know, flat earth simulated world? It's like, man, I couldn't do that to him. It's like it's over. It's over. For him. He's already in his 80s. His career is so far <laughs> in the rearview mirror. It's like, what good would it do anyway? There is there's conditioning. And then there'd be someone like this guy. Right, who 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 was so proud of the work the the work he did and the the moon stuff that he did. Um, uh, did you by the way? Did you guys ever see? I don't know if David ever showed it to you. Did you ever see the the little clip of? Uh, I mean, I'm sure he showed you the slide of the uh, the was it the Challenger? Which one blew up in '86? Yeah, the Challenger. Challenger. Oh, the moment Jake's dad laughed. Yeah, yeah. There was six <laughs> or seven of them. They're still around, and we actually went to one of their houses. Right. We went to the the one of the, the guy was actually outside shoveling his driveway. We were talking to this guy. And again, when you look at the challenger people and look at their faces, some of them had really distinct faces. Oh, and, yeah. Like, and, and you realize, you know, Hollywood aging software is still isn't very good. But people aging naturally, you're looking, it's like, oh, yeah, that's the guy. Right. And I'm, I'm and I remember how ready he was for the questions when they were asking him. Right. But he was asking he was answering them wrong. And, you know, it's like, it's like, oh, yeah, people have told me my whole life I've looked like this guy. It's like, really? You look just like this guy your whole life, right? It's like, wow, that's pretty weird. You don't hear about that unless you're a twin or something. But what got <laughs> me was when it was done, you, you know, you watch enough crime shows, you figure out a few things, right? There's something he left out. You know what he left out? The alibi, which was the first thing you would do if you're being accused of something, right? It's like, hey, did you fake the, you know, fake the challenge or anything in 1986? First thing you should do, it's like, no, in 1986, I was in Nebraska, you know, working at, you know, I was going to, you know, I was finishing my graduate studies or whatever. At no point did he ever say that. He was, in fact, at one, he even let it slip. It's like, I heard it, it was a pretty good, he was a pretty cool guy. It's almost like he couldn't help himself knowing that he was protected on the outside. The interview was only going to go so far, right? Before all he had to do was make a phone call and be like, chase, chase us off. 
And one point he even said he was thinking about calling the FBI to make sure people didn't talk to him. But interesting to me that uh, that he would he would dodge that. And again, why? Absolutely. Why would back in 86 protective custody wasn't even a thing? Why? Why would you even bother? The Internet was quite a ways off. So why? Why would you even bother that? Anyway, sorry. So, all right. I want to I want to ask you something, you guys. But it was it was not what it became. Right. It was only for guys who like were international criminals who really had to go off grid Rico wasn't even a thing yet. So even the big mob guys were getting brought down for treasury and income tax right. evasion. So as far as like WITSEC was concerned, you had things like Project Paperclip for like specialty cases, but on the onesies and twosies of people that were trying to disappear, nah, not anywhere near what it became in the 80s and 90s for sure. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Yeah, and again, why well, I, I get it. In fact, I don't blame them. It's like, yeah, in fact, it was interesting that all these former astronauts, these dead astronauts, were um they were mostly they were either heads of their own companies or they were professors in different schools it's just like yeah that's a that's a good gig sure you pay for their schooling and then you ship them off somewhere and that's and you know they make slight variations of their name who's going to question it and then the internet i mean come on the internet we didn't even pick up on it until 2015 so it's like oh yeah and then we got into that's a long time that's 30 years until oh, you, yeah. you sorry go ahead no, no, I'm, I'm yeah, I'm agreeing with you. I I wanted to bring this up to you. So, yeah. like like we said, we've had plenty of flat earthers on this show, whether right. it be David Weiss or Sean Hibbler. I mean, many many flat earthers, and we sure. do love having these conversations. But I, you know, it's not so much a problem. But I think the best way to be able to convince somebody of something is not always just. Uh, debating style. Like, for example, right. you know, whenever you see Trump versus Biden or Trump versus Hillary, it's it's not why you should vote for me. It's why you shouldn't vote for them. Right. Right. And that's right. like an argument that is always made, especially in flat earth. Well, I'm going to prove to you that it's flat by proving to you that it's absolutely not spherical. Right. But my question always goes back to, and I and I do believe that the 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 traditional uh, thought of the the world being one big ball floating out in out, outer space, can't say that I actually agree with that. Sure. However, doesn't necessarily mean I'm a flat earther. How would you try to present or prove in your in your you know your own way, your best way, that the yeah. Earth is flat by not only disproving that it's not round? Okay, I'll give you, some people know this story, some people don't. Uh, there was, in fact, that that question was posed to me a few years ago by a German television team. They said, we've got a physicist at Georgetown. And what we're going to do is we are going to record your questions on video, and then we're going to pass them to him like notes in class. Because, and I, I questioned that, and it's like, well, because he's really dry. Right. It's like we it's not going to be fair if you if you get in a room with him, you're just going to be, you know, ramping up your RPMs and, and he's not going to be able to catch up. So we're going to we're going to have you ask come up with five little points that you could throw at any scientist. Right. That would prove. In one way, in one capacity or another, that the, the world's um, uh, the world's flat or at the very least enclosed or whatever you want to call it. And so. um the the big five and I'll, I'll rattle them off really fast which is um uh, first one that gets most people into it because people's like well how do most people get it most people get into it that has nothing to do with the clues by the way i always thought that was funny i never did anything on long distance photography ever never once told people to go out to the beach <laughs> amazingly enough all these people instinctively start running down these bodies of water and calling me it's like oh dude i shot this lighthouse oh i shot this ship i shot this like why and it's like, well, because the water lays flat. It's like, okay. So the first one, long distance photography, which is, um, again, if the curvature of the earth is eight inches per mile per mile, then eventually something should be over the the, the curvature of the earth, right? Eventually it's going to be on the other side of the hill. I don't care if you build in refraction or whatever it is. And that's part of the design of this place, which is, which is by the way, different from the video game world, or the simulated world, which is in the simulated world, there's no atmosphere, right? There's no, there's no nothing. Right. There's there's nothing there. I mean, what we're breathing in is 80 percent nitrogen and 20 percent oxygen will leave out the trace gases, which means it compounds over time, which means it gets thicker over the time, which is eventually people, people say, why can't you see Japan from California? Why can't you see um, Europe for um, France from New York? And why can't you see Mount Everest from everywhere? 
for example. It's because it's a thick, there's a thickness of the atmosphere. It eventually, there's so much thickness that it'll, it'll fade out everything, including the sun. And I'm sure David Weiss has shown that to you, which is so weird. He was one of the first people to dig that up, which is like, if you get the sun in the right place and you have the right lens, the sun will just go away. It'll just lose itself like it was going into fog, but it's not. It's a clear day. Um, second and point, to point also, there's a reason why people can look directly at the sun during sunrise and sunset. Because when you're looking across the horizon, I think I read somewhere that you're looking through like six feet of water and two feet of dirt. Ooh, that's and good. Particles in the air, the dust, the humidity, yeah. all you're looking through that much of a filter to be able to directly look at the sun. You can't do that at high noon, but you can do it at dusk and dawn. Yeah. So to your point, the atmosphere does get thicker over time. Now we're yep. talking across how far of a gap for you to look and see something in your naked eye. Yeah. yeah. Which is which is also, by the way, why the, the moon is so huge on the horizon. And there's like scientists don't know how to explain it. It's like, you know, because when it gets up in the middle of the sky, it's like, oh, it doesn't look that big. And it's like, yeah, it's because it's atmospheric lensing, right? The, the, the air acts as a lens, and we didn't come up with that term. It was a meteorological term, which is, oh, that's cool. Um, the magnifying glass effect, essentially. Yeah, the magnifying glass, which is, uh, again, you could take a glass of water and a flashlight on a, on a table, a flat table. Aren't all tables flat? I think they are. We should and flats kind of redundant. And you move you move the the flashlight back from the the glass to the other end of the table, and you can make the flashlight set. Uh, or hang on, take a take a basketball to a um uh or football. Basketball's easier because you know the basketball court is flat, and you roll the ball to the other end. The basketball set. Same 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 sort of thing. Anyway, uh, second one would be the my favorite, which is uh, gravity versus the vacuum of space. I've always liked this one. Uh, it's tougher for people to understand because most people don't deal with vacuums ever. Uh, they, you know, they deal with looking long distance. People get that. But the gravity versus the vacuum of space is, uh, if you've ever dealt with vacuum chambers, vacuum is nothing. So if we're breathing in nitro nitrogen, nitrogen and oxygen, you take those out, there's nothing there. People, It's so tough for people to visualize nothing, right? But nothing means that but it's invisible to us so if you have a vacuum chamber and, and you know next to you with a window right which i always loved it's like oh yeah you know it's a vacuum chamber you can't tell visually that it's a vacuum chamber you just have to take their word for it well, unless you you do some stuff like i don't know introduce you know some some sort of particles that will show so if there's a vacuum chamber above you and you have a valve and you pull it what happens well, the air is going to rush up. It's not like the movies unfortunately hollywood you know has to take some some narrative license which is why the end of Aliens, uh, Aliens 2 with Sigourney Weaver is always ruined for me now. Because, you know, she's climbing out. She's got a huge door exposed to the vacuum of space. And she's pulling herself up with a with an alien hanging on her ankle. It's like, whatever. <laughs> They'd all be dead. Girl's dead. She's dead. The alien's dead. Everyone's dead. The only one that lives <laughs> is Hicks. Because he's in. he was he was actually still in the ship. They, they put him in the harness. Hopefully the door was shut. Whatever. So, um... If that happens, right, that it's going to equalize instantly, instantly, violently, so instantly. So if that's the case, then when you go outside, right, why is our atmosphere still here? And the only answer you have, the only one anyone comes in is, well, it's gravity. And it's a circular argument. It's like, why is it gravity? Cool, well, because if it isn't gravity, then we're dead. I go, well, unless there's a dome, unless you're in an actual pressurized system, then the air doesn't go anywhere because there is no space. And so let me ask you this theory to Go the ahead. pressure and the gravity and all of that so the way it was explained to me because i work in the industrial field and i work in instrumentation so when we're talking about vacuum and pr pressure and reverse pressure and things like that yeah. i actually calibrate the devices that can retake take these readings and i have to do that for work from time to time yeah. um not often a lot of what i do in my line in our process doesn't require much of a vacuum and if it does we're talking a few inches in water negative maybe which if anybody does understand pressure you breathing is multiple inches in water as far as pressure is concerned sure. it's it's i forget what the conversion of psi is but it's a fuck ton yeah anyway my point being that the vacuum so to speak of space, right? right? I've, I've been told that the reason why we have pressure on this earth is because if you were to take all the oxygen, all the nitrogen, all the carbon dioxide, all the argon, all the, if you were to take just a, a random air sample of the earth's atmosphere, our air, right. and you were to take every single oxygen particle and you were to stack them on top of your head from here to the very tippy top of our atmosphere, yeah. that would lead you to 14.676, I believe, 696, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. 
uh, PSI. That is where we get our pressure from because that's the gravitational force of all those molecules of different types of gases right. pushing down on us. Right. So it's not necessarily that there's some glass ceiling. <laughs> that's just where the gravity stops. We don't have any more uh, gas molecules beyond that point for gravity to pull down more. Gotcha. That's the gotcha. And and to clarify, uh, we'll just say three quarters. Three quarters of the of the flat Earth community believe in some sort of dome the others just believe that it's an open space and there is no dome mostly because it's like ah, don't fence me in captain bring down that whole thing it's like right. they don't like to be you know it's like in anyway. a box yeah but to 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 your point uh because i've asked this of a number of scientists and you, you don't have to answer but i've asked a whole bunch of scientists i go tell me what happens where our atmosphere ends and space begins right what happens at the bleeding edge of space and I've had even had a physicist, I remember it was a girl, uh, I can't remember what country I was in, but, she, but it was a younger physicist. And she said, um, she goes, oh, well, there's so few particles out there, it barely touches it. And I go, well, that argument really doesn't work. And here's why. Imagine this. Imagine you you have a box, like a cardboard box. You have some packing popcorn in it, and you have a little piece of tape on the bottom to hold it. And what happens? You pick up the box, <clears throat> nothing happens. Right? Packing popcorn holds the box perfectly fine. Fine. Put the box back down, leave the packing popcorn, take a bunch of heavy books. Just pack them on top. What happens when you pick up the box? The heavy books just rip through the thing. They push the packing, packing popcorn and everything straight down. Imagine that, but in space. Space, remember, the, the vacuum is... You know, nature hates a vacuum. It is going to try to equalize absolutely instantly. So it doesn't care about the trace particles. It's going after everything all the way to the freaking ground. It's going to go after the helium and hydrogen and all the fluorocarbons and everything. It's going to go straight to the oxygen. It's going to go all the way down to the 14 PSI. It's probably going to grab the oceans too at that point. Because if a vacuum is exposed to uh, water, by the way, that's a quick way you can test. Sorry, one, one, one last thing on the... Um, uh, uh, the vacuum thing, because I put a test out there for years just to put you know, money where your mouth is. I challenged anybody at university. I said, look, you want you want me to get quit flat earth? Fine. Loan me any astronaut suit from any era, by the way, because they all worked. I don't know why they keep changing them because I mean, they all worked flawlessly. Nobody died. Put me in a vacuum chamber, a university vacuum chamber, and then pull the switch. Tell me what happens, right? Because... The spacesuit should absolutely expand into a balloon, right? It should fill the, you know, everything. Go on YouTube all day long. Anything in a vacuum chamber, if it's soft, expands. Everything to a point where it bursts. And, and it will fill the shape of whatever it is. I should turn into a parade float and just tip over and die. Tell me, I, first, before I get in there, tell me what magical thing in that backpack of, of the, of the spacesuit, tell me what keeps me, keeps it from counteracting the, the force of the vacuum of space. And the other thing, sorry, one one side note of that is I always thought it was curious that during Apollo, and, and you probably know scuba divers, right? Scuba divers, all they care about is their freaking oxygen, well, you know, nitrogen oxygen mix. How, all they care about is that freaking big dial on their on their wrist or whatever they're carrying. It's like how much air I got left, how much they're constant, they're obsessed with. It's like stare, 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 because you know what they don't want to be in the bad place. It's like how many minutes do I have left? Air they're breathing. Yeah. Right. You know who didn't care about that or even had a gauge? Astronauts. The astronauts, they never <laughs> mentioned it once, ever. It's like, really? Unlimited air? Because you guys were driving that freaking moon car a long way the hell away from this. And it's like, if that moon car breaks down, shouldn't you be like, well, I only got 20 minutes of air left, Fred? I don't know if there was a guy named Fred. But anyway, yeah. so the the and so why I bring up the, the, the vacuum versus the space thing. The challenge I had, by the way, why they'll never, ever call me and they'll never, ever do it. Because, yeah, technically, if you wanted to, if I was dumb, you could just bring me into any chamber, make some air sounds. It's like, well, you're in a vacuum chamber now. It's like, really? Because I can prove I'm in a vacuum chamber one way or there for like $4. Tap water in a vacuum chamber boils instantly, right? It just starts boiling. Not because of heat. It just starts boiling off. Uh, any just a single breath of a balloon, little party balloon, will just start expanding. And, of course, the, the kicker is take, I don't know, $5 cheap bell bells don't work in a vacuum because the sound waves can't travel through nothing anyway sorry um third one real fast i i, I know I, I i gotta hurry which is um third one is the eclipse shadow which i love which is uh um the eclipse shadow is too small so if the moon is two thousand miles wide 
why is the eclipse shadow, you know, the one that's coming up in the East Coast here pretty soon, it's going to be rolling through. I know we've got a bunch of people in different things, different states that are going to be watching it. Uh, why is the eclipse shadow only 70 miles wide? Why why the shadow reduced down from 2,000 miles to 70 miles? Uh, everybody knows that shadows are only actual size or longer, depending on what angle the light is. Then you never walk by a building and your shadow turns into an action figure. Never, ever happens. It only goes actual or longer. So, and what's interesting is the blackout zone is 70 miles wide, which is roughly what we say the moon is anyway. Which is kind of coincidence, but hey, whatever. Um, the fourth one would be the uh, the moon temperature test, which I love. Uh, I didn't come up with it, somebody, but I did come up with the magnifying version of it, which is everyone knows that in the sun shade, it's 10 degrees, at least 10 degrees cooler. So if it's like 80 degrees in the sun, it's 70 degrees in the shade. Everybody knows this. But in the moon, right. it's the opposite. So if it's 50 degrees in the moonlight, it's sometimes 60 degrees or warmer in the moon shade. And I remember the first person told me this. It was like, what are you talking about? In fact, you can test this with a, I got one of these things, you know, one of these point and click, uh, you know, these temperature guns you can buy for like 20 bucks. You know, the, you, yeah. you test them to like test asphalt and engine blocks and crap like that. And I tested them myself and we got saw stuff up to like 13 degrees Fahrenheit, which is weird. It's like, okay, why is the moon generating a cold laser light? Now, does that pr prove that the world's flat? No, but it absolutely destroys the relationship between the sun and the moon. Because remember, the moon's only lit up because the uh, it's reflecting off the sun. It should never go negative. In fact, it gets even weirder than that. And by, by the way, scientists won't even touch this one where they say, because I said, um, hey, you know, when you take a magnifying glass to sunlight, you can burn things like ants, you know, and your sister and stuff like that. So when you take a, a, a magnifying glass to moonlight, what happens? Gets even yeah. colder. Gets even colder by like a couple of degrees. Freaks Get out of here. I didn't know that. True. I brought it up on the show before, bro. The moon is an absolute cold source radiator. Uh, radiator. Okay, under a full moon, you can take a magnifying glass and concentrate that beam. I have been wanting to experiment to see if you can get it cold enough to freeze water. But I know for a fact, and I have tested this myself, yeah. the moon makes shit colder by its light. And yeah. that doesn't make any sense. And I do believe in a round Earth, but I also can acknowledge there is fuckery afoot, gents. There you go. There you go. Yeah, and by the way, it, and, and and cold laser light is not a new technology. We do it all the time. You can go on Amazon and buy cold laser beauty products for all sorts of crap. You know, some's yeah. probably some some's probably snake oil, um, but it is absolutely. And I've seen this done with uh, with copper strips and water. I've seen it with dry tests. In fact, there's a wonderful video on my channel where there was a, a Glover guy. He's like, I'm gonna find this for myself, and he set his camera up for uh, predator vision, which I didn't even know you could do. And he was walking around his neighborhood. And he's going out uh, during like a full, you know, like a full moon. He's like, I'll be damned. You know, he didn't, he still wasn't going to say that the world was flat, but he was going to say this moon, there's something about this moon thing. I love the fact that university people won't touch this. It's like, oh no, they'll do a Dunning-Kruger effect. You know, you'll get a PhD for that. Yeah. But you're not going to do a dissertation on the the cold moon. It's like, whatever. Um, right. last, but, last but not least was the, um, the five question was the, uh, the Van Allen radiation belts, which I love. Um, which is announced by Van Allen, a NASA employee in the 1950s. He said, no one should ever, ever go up there. Super dangerous. People will die, right? Really bad. And then, of course, Kennedy screws the whole thing up and says, we choose to go to the moon this decade, do the other thing, blah, blah, blah. And so they have to go back to Van Allen and they said, uh, uh, hey, how are you guys going to get past it? Right? Didn't you just say that you couldn't go through it? It's like, oh, we're going to go really, really fast. They like, what are you talking about? Your, your best, I'm sounding like Norm MacDonald. The um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> your best speed is only eighteen thousand. Uh, the um, uh, your best speed is only eighteen thousand miles an hour. So how are you gonna get you know? And plus the you know that's mo multiple hours in 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 these Van Allen belts, right? And the reason why I brought that up was uh, because it's so it's a simple question, which is the the question for the the scientists is are the Van Allen belts deadly? Yes or no? Well. If you say they're deadly, then how the Americans get through them with no shielding to speak of, right? You know, the only things that can stop radiation are um, lead and gold, which is twice as dense as lead for those who don't know, and um, and water, a whole bunch of water for power plants. Well, that's absolutely the opposite of what you'd ever put on any sort of aircraft <laughs> for various reasons. Right? You don't put a big anchor on the front of anything. And yet, so would they use aluminum and plastic? That's what they use. And you want to see they use gold foil, foil. It's like, okay, fine. But nobody died. Nobody got radiation poisoning. Nobody even got cancer. There's still, I think, four of them running around today. I don't know when Buzz Aldrin's going to die ever. 
and that dude's timeless, dude. He is timeless. He's got to fucking live forever. Die. That's just not in our nature. <laughs> but there's, but so I go, okay, so they aren't deadly. So then you look up a wonderful video on, uh, it's easy to find on the NASA.gov site called Orion Trial by Fire. And they were talking about how they can't put people in the Orion capsules to test for radiation because they haven't solved the radiation problem yet from the Van Allen belts. It's like, and it was made in 2014. It's like, what are you talking about? You haven't solved it. You solved it perfectly. You solved it in the 60s. In fact, it was flawless. You couldn't have done any better. So right. why, why, why are you not, why are you not testing this? Anyway, those five questions I threw at the, um, uh, the physicist and he folded. That was it. He said, nope, not doing them. Now in his defense, when you are an astrophysicist, your wheelhouse is very, very narrow. I knew that the, some of these questions he couldn't touch and physicists, when you reach a PhD level, what happens, unfortunately, is you don't make opinions on things that you haven't studied. So he didn't feel qualified. That wasn't his area of expertise to answer some of those questions. Therefore, he wasn't going to answer some of those questions. Therefore, the interview was off. And it's like, yeah, I get it. I mean, come on. The moon, the, the moon temperature thing alone, what is he going to do with that? He's not going to be able to, to do anything. He might be able to touch Van, the Van Allen belts, and he might be able to. He wouldn't be able to touch the, the camera thing because meteorology isn't his thing. So I get it. But those, those were usually the, the five big ones that I, that I throw at people. It's like yeah, they, they all are typically pretty uh, compartmentalized for sure. You know, you're not really looking at a big picture, but it is interesting to even make somebody question even, you know, their their own perspective on on what things are, because then it's like, all right, well, if that's really the case, that astronauts really never went to the moon, that the, the sunlight really isn't the cause of the moonlight. Yeah. I mean, that, that water doesn't curve or, or anything like that, like. Uh, in their reality, it doesn't fit and it doesn't even help them to move forward in their reality, especially if their line of work is with NASA or no. any kind of astrophysicist in general. No, you're, you're absolutely so right. Easily fact, dismissible at that point to them. Yes, you, you, you're 100 percent right uh, to where I've even said, I go, look, if you because people say, well, how should I introduce this and how should I introduce that? I go, well, there's wonderful videos out there. But the first thing I ask them is like, OK, what's the level of education to person you're talking with? Now, if you're you're talking to somebody who's got a bachelor's and they've got family that work for NASA or work in the aerospace industry, eh, you, you, you'll see. But you you should really come at them side side saddle, saddle up to them, or side saddle, saddle up to them and say um, and ask them if they believe the that the americans went to the moon now if you ask them that you know what do you think about it? the americans go to the moon if they all of a sudden start you know welling up right you know it's like instead say like those brave boys right and then a single tear rolls down their face and and drops off and turns into a bald eagle and flies away then no no there's nothing you can do there they're 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 stuck <laughs> they're, they're not going to snap out of it also, if they have a, a, um, a master's degree in any sort of physical science, like geology or biology or hydrology, it's, it's too much. And I look, I, I have academics for friends, and I know that when, once you've committed to that, once you've spent so much money on your education, all you care about is your peer groups and being published. And by published, I don't mean, you know, New York Times. I'm talking, you know, a peer-reviewed paper published. You know, it's like, oh, it was published, yeah. That whole thing, um, because that the the scariest word for anybody in that realm is ostracized. So that's all I tell them. Like, Look, they have a master's degree in physical science. Nothing you can do. They're cooked. It's over. Just let them, let them do their thing. We'll we'll go around them. We'll flank them. We'll win by attrition. Uh, the rest of them, we we don't need, which is fine. You like I'm not, I, I'm never going to get Neil Tyson. Right? <laughs> never. It's uh, never ever going to happen. I've never even be able to talk to Neil Tyson. Well, is it that they're so brainwashed and they're so cooked, or is it they have they have delved so deep into what they have studied that they have found this to be true, and therefore it's proven to be unshakable to them? Uh, I, I, I go I go with the, the first. physical sciences because I don't want to say the political and the the anthropological and the the social right. sciences because that's all philosophical and the evolution of the mind and the culture is ever going. But as far as those that commit themselves, like you said, to the physical sciences, right? Well, but even but even to your to your point there, where there are people that once you again once you have, I hate it hanging out with the academics because once once you got your master's degree in anything, all the people you knew were also master's students in different things, and you were there was this there was this hive mind thing that was going on, which was 
the the science was science in general i mean god how many people came to me and said you know it's like how do you know you know the world's a globe and, and they would come out it's like science they would literally say that word of going what about science right I'll, I'll give you one really quick and this on a side note this won't get us into trouble or anything there was a video I was watching of a guy uh it was his husband and wife and he had he was a lifelong chemical engineer right lifelong you might have even seen it recently it was the last couple of weeks lifelong chemical engineer retired he's 80 now right he, you could tell he and his wife were both serious academics he was having some side effect issues from something that may have happened recently right serious side effect issues where there's some clotting and he was in trouble he was in real trouble and at one point he, he was he was you could tell in his head he was like he's like no we should there should be studies you know they're involving blah 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 and 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 she was asking him it's like do you believe now because she didn't take it right he did and he's like he's like no he goes i'm i have i am not convinced yet right he, and and you could you could, the way he was saying it he was he was like in one point he said i'm not in the position to judge and, and his wife almost lost it she's like you're in the perfect position to judge you're a freaking career academic you know you're a chemical engineer you know some of these things but you could tell the science was so the institution of that that's the word i was looking for the institution of science was so strong that you can't turn away from it so in, well, at the in, very best, it's conflicting in his mind. Very, very, very cool. But and you, again, some people would say, "Oh, you know, co cognitive dissonance and and stuff like that." But it really comes down to, um, I mean, the simple word is is denial, which is he can't. He's his conditioning is so deep that, and and I don't. I look. I don't blame them. I, I've told. I said this for years, years and years. Which is like, look, even if you could convince them, you'd be wrecking them. They'd be all they're going to do. I mean, what do you do at that point? Right. If they're in their mid thirties, early forties, whatever, you know, if you catch them young, all they're going to do is go back to their condo and sit in a fetal position in a corner with a bottle and pull the drapes. They're not coming out for a while because it's, it's too, it's too much. Um, not to, not to you steal from the matrix, but I do like that line. I mean, very similar red pill, blue pill, which the line, it's like, we don't free minds after a certain age. Because of exactly what happened to Neo, where he freaking snapped. In fact, he could have easily stroked out at that point. And the movie would have been over. It would have been a terrible movie. <laughs> but it's but it's true where there's a lot of people. It's like they they can't. We it kids are more pliable. Creative minds are more pliable. I've found. You know the we we run into a lot of artistic types, of course, right? You know. Oh yeah, you got to be open minded to this kind of stuff in the first place to even. To, if you're not out there questioning yeah. things, you're never really going to fully understand how things actually work. You're just going to go along to get along because why question it? Because right. science, like that's not a good, uh, that's not a good answer. That's right? a terrible answer. It's a, it's a terrible answer. But, but, I, but also we run into um, the, the, the general conspiracies, as you know, are a slippery slope. Once you start going down the rabbit holes, well, I mean, honestly, you, you know, part of my story, which is I didn't even think people lied until I saw JFK, the movie in the theater in the early 90s. Did not even think people in authority. I thought the world, can remember, I grew up during the 80s. It's like everything was shiny and bright. It's like, oh, it's just wonderful. And then, you know, Oliver Stone's movie came out, you know, when he got to actually make movies that he, before the government got to him. And uh, and I never, by the way, I will never watch his Twin Towers movie ever. The um, Just based on the reviews. But when I saw JFK in the theater, packed theater, when we were walking out of there, he, there were uh, you could tell people were upset. He did that perfect blending of real footage and his footage to where when you were done, you were, what, was pushing a three hour movie, right? Where it was that was three hours just hitting you to where the government had to respond. I remember this. He was doing talk shows and the government had to send out uh, spin reps to sit in the chairs next to him to give like the, you know, the, their rebuttals because he had he had done a lot of uh, of. Damage. I don't know where I was going with that other than, yeah, I didn't believe in conspiracies at all. And uh, well, the conspiracy word has been so tainted, right? And it's been made to be such a negative connotation because culturally they want us to seem like we are ostracized, right? We're like basement dwellers and all this. Right. Meanwhile, it's not even that way anymore, especially I would argue from about 08 
to now the conspiracy minded person, quote unquote, right. is now being asked questions by their peer group that they never were getting asked six years ago, eight years ago, especially before COVID and before all these bullshit vaccines. Right. Yeah. So especially now more than ever, that conspiracy friend in the group that's kind of on some wild shit is getting asked by random people at random times, getting those text messages that they nobody wants to be the one to ask him this. Right. But getting asked this by all of the people collectively, hey, bro, I just saw this. What do you think that means? And it's Absolutely. like, all right, come on in, dip your toes in this water. I promise it's going to hurt at first, but it's going to be okay. I thought but it was all... That how, isn't that how, like, uh, like uh, not institutions, but programs, maybe, um, uh, things that, as soon as somebody starts questioning it, it's things start to crumble big time. So, yeah. like, uh, for example, I mean, uh, if you've ever had a dream, if you go up to somebody whenever you're in the middle of a dream, maybe it's a, uh, uh, what is it, a vivid dream or whatever while you're... Or a lucid, a lucid dream, dream. while yeah. you're aware, right? You go up to somebody while you're in a lucid dream and you ask them what the time is. It's like the fucking world just starts to collide in right. on it. Right. Yeah. And I think that a lot of and if enough people wake up to, you know, what's really going on, no matter what conspiracy it is, all it takes is one just to plant that seed. Yeah. As If enough people ingest that seed and that seed starts to sprout, I think that whatever kind of. Uh, situation we're living in whatever kind of simulation or matrix or whatever is it's on the verge of implosion i Don't we you know what let me let me let me jump off on that one on that point because there was something i don't bring this up a lot uh but it was something i put in the clues which was which was ended up being one of my little hidden second goals of you know why i do this why i keep doing this you know and that is i i call it the um tower of babel protocol Otherwise known as the you know, Babel Protocol for short. And if you guys, anyone's listening out there, that if you don't follow the Bible too much, uh, the Tower of Babel story, you know, from Genesis, is one of my favorite and shortest stories I've ever heard. But I expanded on it and made an entire clue about it, which was imagine an early civilization. You know, one because again, we're not the first people to rent this apartment, not by a long shot. And I think, you know, people that are doing the Tower of Babel, they're not connected to us in our historical timeline very closely which was a civilization that was amazingly unified and advanced and motivated. I think it was too perfect, not to steal from the Matrix, but I think it was too perfect to where they figured out where they were almost instantaneously. Once they got to a certain level of tech, it's like, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, I know exactly where I am. And they, um, they decided to build, and, and the leader's like, you know what? Pretty sure, again, if it was a dome, pretty sure we can make it. You know, what do you think, engineers? Think we can make it up there? Think we can actually build a bridge to see God? Let's see if we can let's see if we can see who God really is, right? And the story goes, once they start building this, right, God looks down, you know, if it's God's footstool, and, you know, it's like, looks down. I'm sure it would have been priceless to shoot if you wanted to do it like a short, short story. Or the, he looks down, it's like, ah, crap. They're going to make it. Pretty sure they're going to make it. Yeah, we can't have that. So scatter, scatter, scatter. Languages, languages, languages. Get rid of this tower. You know, race, 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 race. And then and then start over. Why that I think that applies. I think ever since then, because remember that version of of this world. Because again, I don't think I I do believe in there are things flying around there all 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 the time. They've been flying around for centuries and centuries. But I don't think they're us. I think they're just older versions of us. I don't think they're from Mars and Venus and Jupiter. I just think they're. But well, some people want to say, oh, they're like Indiana Jones interdimensional. It's like yeah, they don't have to be. If you want to be that, that's fine. But I think they're just older versions of us. Kind of like the senior, the, the fact that they could be. What? Do you believe that they could be other entities, not versions of humans or humanoids? Oh no, no, other entities. Uh, no, I'm sorry. When I say older versions of us, I mean older, older civilizations. How's that? Okay, so but, what some might call an alien from another planet that may not look like us, but has at least similar uh, right, humanoid. Plus. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. No, I, I know exactly where you're going with that. Yeah, yeah. No, of course, of course. Yeah, yeah. The um, but but no different than uh, uh again, it, uh, like like a senior. Where was I going with this? Uh oh yeah, Tower of Babel Protocol. But we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Which is, I think every civilization has their limited run. But once, like what you were saying, when they figure out how to break this thing, and and again, I, there's got to be a hidden threshold or multiple hidden thresholds that we don't know about, obviously. Where once you hit that threshold, God 
call him small G, steps in and says, okay, that's it. You know, the novelty's gone. The the reality show that you're in, because nobody's acting naturally anymore. Because once you figure this place out, you're not going to be acting naturally. All of, Which is why I, I talked about in the clues, which is once you figured out, which is why the the the, the globe concept had to be created to re erase the fence. I used the, um, David probably stole this from me which is the the wildlife preserve example, which is you put a thousand um, buffalo in a 10,000 acre wildlife preserve, right? You know, with water and streams and trees and stuff uh, and a fence. They don't care about the fence. Why would they care? They're happy as clams. They can walk around all day for years and years and years. They do not care. You put a dozen people in that same wildlife preserve, where do you think they're going to be hanging out? They're going to be next to that freaking fence. It's all they're going to care about. Why is the fence here? Why are we on this side? Who's on the other side? Did God create the fence? Did we anger the fence gods? We should sacrifice something to the fence gods. And then all of a sudden, it's like, where are the buffalo? And then they start cooking up those things. It'd be a nightmare. So I think every civilization has that that limited run. You know, we've been going for 5,000 years unbroken, right? I mean, come on. There's ruins. I'm not going to give ancient aliens too much credit, but it's a fun show. Where, you know, being Bimini Road and the Bosnian pyramids and the real pyramids and Puma Punku and Machu Picchu, there's ruins from older civilizations. I think they're deliberately left. You know, who knows what, you know, ironically, what probably one of the only things is going to be left from America. It's probably going to be Mount Rushmore. You know, thousands of years from now, that's probably it's going to be one of those Planet of the Apes moments where like somebody walks up. And like, you blew it up. Um, they're going to look at these these dudes faces. Yeah, and yeah. Was, these were obviously their four main deities. Right, they right. Their four main it's like, Yeah. Yeah, because you Absolutely. go, you if you ever been about Rushmore, it's like, oh, yeah, this place is gonna survive something because there's nothing else out there unless a big earthquake takes it down. But then they're think, gonna find the Statue of Liberty somehow and be like, obviously, these <laughs> two factions were at war. They had the woman tribe and they had the four male tribe. Right. Obviously, they had a patriarchy versus matriarchy war. I obviously, mean, that would be awesome. Well, I mean. And also Gobekli Tepe was, it's been around for 12,000 years, you know, there like you that's, that's some really old shit, obviously really old built, shit. Yeah. Like yeah. not built by like animals, like for sure of bipedal course. somethings. Right. So one, uh, so one of my, one of my secondary goals is to see, and this is not some mischievous thing. It's like, come on, we, we, we've done, I think we peaked out uh, our civilization. I think we've gone as far as we're going to, uh, you know, within reason so at, trying to kick off the babylon protocol i think would be a, a a really cool amazing thing why 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 the heck not you know we're wouldn't that be a unifying you know idea now if people want to read into the religious a aspects of it you know the second coming or whatever you know whatever religion you're into that's fine but i i think that's where everyone ends up anyway and but we we have gone a long time with the ninety nine percent of the population not figuring out any of it, you know, we've as much as we've gotten to our technological points where ever you know all, people have access to so much technology. There's so many dumb people out there. So I mean, two hundred years ago, most people couldn't read on Earth. I know, like I know. We think we're so smart and we're so advanced, like. Right. Old people had it so figured out. Like, yeah, they had certain things figured out for sure. Right. I think another thing too, right? We've gained certain knowledge, but we've also lost certain knowledge. And I don't mean this to be some sort of crazy secret stuff, but like very simply put, I don't know many farmers today that could hook up to a mule to plow their fields. Ooh, they that's a good one. Other fields. You see what I'm saying? I'm not even saying some crazy convoluted thing. The very basics. Oh, yeah. I don't know. That could still hook up to the mule and plow the field these days. But 200 years ago, yeah, the guy who couldn't read or do basic math, he could absolutely hook up to the mule. You see yep. what I'm saying? Yep, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. There are generations, I mean, even even within the last 50, 60 years where there were guys out there that could do a lot of stuff. I mean, my, my brother-in-law, for God's sakes, you know. Now, granted, he doesn't, there's not a lot of highbrow thinking there, but could he you know, repair an engine, no matter what happened to it. Could, did he build his own plane? Could he build his own house? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, but to, to your point, uh, we, we, yeah, we've gotten to that stage now where, um, the, the, in fact, I wrote a survival manual after Katrina, for example, did called, you? I did, uh, I'll send you guys the PDF after we're done. The, so um, wait, after Katrina, so you know, we're in Louisiana. 
Oh, I didn't Speak know that. So you're in Louisiana. Oh, okay. well, we were based out of Louisiana. My boy here just recently moved just outside of H town in Texas, but I am still in Louisiana. Yeah. A lot of people. Yeah. A lot of people from Katrina went to H town. A lot of people went to Texas and never came back, as you know. Yeah, a lot of people ended up in jail because they realized that Texas has an actual, you know, law system. And, <laughs> not, and they realized the 30 day murder trial did not apply anywhere else on Earth except New Orleans. But whatever. Oh, wow. Uh, the after Katrina, I was so watching all the news and everything that happened down there. I was so appalled at how little, you know, how quickly people went from zero to some sort of dystopian movie attitude that it's like, oh man, I, I, I at the very least I got to get, so I wrote a thing called empty shelves. And to your point, there was a, I prefaced this and it really was called the urban survival thing where it was like, look, you're not going to the woods. Yeah. 99% of Americans, you're not going to, you try to go to the woods, you're dead or you're coming out, you know, starving. And then you're going to get picked off by big people. It's like, look, you're just going to have to, it, it's going to turn into a fallout game scenario where you're just, it's going to be urban warfare and you're going to, you're going to have to deal with whatever. And even then I remember I was disheartened um, by some of the people, especially the young men that would write me back after I sent them the manual. I will send it to you after I'm, after I'm done where they said, Oh, we don't have to stock up on supplies. So, but that was, that was the other part about Katrina that bugged me is that most of the people that came back, that came back still didn't get supplies. Still didn't right. prep. It's like you were chased out of your own city, right? You, you were, I mean, if it was national, you guys would be freaking done. But the the young men that would told me, told me, it's like, oh, I don't have to buy supplies. It's like, why? Well, because I'm going to steal from from people that that do. And I'm going, yeah, but you're saying it and you're saying it. And you're saying it. And you're saying it. You realize most of the people here are saying the same thing. So you know how that plays out. It's like, okay, you're going to go out there with your two boxes of bullets Right. And you're going to think that you're going to pick off supplies and you're going to you're going to get in a firefight with somebody. You're going to go in their place and realize they have nothing. And then you're going to get in a firefight with another guy and you realize nothing. Now you're out of bullets. Now what? Now what are you going to do? So, and this is why when the time comes, I'm getting on the houseboat. I'm heading through the bayou. Y'all ain't finding me nice. for years. And nice. I may come back to shore in a few years when people get there to get some act right. Well, but I'm not playing these fuck fuck games in the streets with these people. Got I'm, me be fucked I, up nice i'm on an island in the northwest of the united states uh just next to canada i can see canada from right up the road not that i'd go to canada i lived in canada for a year it's fine but uh but yeah i wrote a survival manual to the point i was getting there was the average person the average people out there not not the fine listeners of this show no the fine right, listeners right, of the course, show they're course. enlightened and wonderful and I'm sure they're ready for anything but if, anyone, if, any, if anyone's curious please email me and I will send you a free copy of the uh, survival guide in PDF form. If you want to buy it, it's on Amazon. I don't really care. I actually did an audio version too, but it was mostly because I wanted, I was mostly for my family when I first did it. You know, my, my cousins and, and distant relatives is like, look, you guys really need to back up something. You got to have a backup plan. And so uh, can you, I know you're limited on time here, but that's right. real, can you go a couple of steps in like what you mean by urban survival as opposed because so I grew up in the woods. I grew up in the bayou. I can figure it out, especially in Louisiana where I grew up in these woods. I can survive. Right. But for your average person living in suburban areas, right? Okay, some no, and we can, we can go a good, we can go a little longer. That's fine. I we honestly whatever. I for we, instance, most I don't know, I don't know how many more questions you have in your list, but we can we can go through them. That's fine. Okay. I got a couple more. We'll get there. Okay. Okay. The um so the urban survival thing. Uh, the summary is, is that as long as you're all you have to do is stay ahead of the mob. That's the big thing. The mob is going. the 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 key to this is the mob is going to make very blatant moves that are so predictable because they're going to act like a mob, right? And they're predictable because it's been done multiple times. Yeah, yeah. it's it, human human beings. Right. Look, there's a lot of NPCs out there. I'm not shy about saying it. And they're going to do pre-programmed things. They're going to hang out by the grocery store, the general grocery store. They're going to wait until the power comes back on. And really, the whole guide is just for a long-term power outage. But I don't care about meteorites or zombies or whatever else. Just long-term power outage. That's the big key. Until the power goes out, People, believe it or not, and I've seen this in multiple situations, people act pretty much normal. As long as the power's yeah, on. I've said. A nuclear fallout is not our biggest threat. A EMP attack. If America lost our power grid 
instantly. Oh, that yeah. is people would lose their collective shit. Very, very fast. Um, people will initially think will hang by their local grocery stores and then the light bulb will come on. It's like, oh, I'm going to go, you know, hang out by Costco or Sam's Club or whatever it is. It's like, again, have you been by a Costco? It's a brick building with very few windows and steel gates for a front. And a lot of people don't know, but you guys know down where you are, that if something bad happens, local governments grab their SWAT teams and they immediately go to the, the bulk food stores. They shut the doors and nobody comes in. However, that's only going to hold out so long because if you have a thousand people on the outside of those doors, you better take like, I don't know, five figures worth of ammo and have to squ and lay down some suppressing fire every once in a while because once you stop firing, they're going to try for it. They're going to do something dumb. The 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 general public's going to do this. So uh, the the things I recommend for people in those sort of scenarios is you go for the small stores. The strip mall stores that have various foods, and it doesn't, like, who cares about looking for quality food? You want stuff that doesn't, you know, perishable stuff is not what you want to go for. And you'd be amazed because of how America is, how many stores have resources you can use in them. Not necessarily things like a 7-Eleven or crap like that, but any sort of store that has food products in it you or or batteries or light sources or candles or clothing or whatever you need. You can well, find family those. dollar. The you yes, there you, but, yeah, I there mean, you the go. Mexican stores up. The ones that sell tacos in the back and everything up front, like nothing's in English. I'm hitting them stores up because only so many people in this city even know that those places it, have food it, inside of them. Exactly. It, by the, what you're hoping for in the in this book, or is that you again, all you you don't even have to be that fast. All you have to do is be you know the old joke. I don't have to be faster than the zombies, all I have to do is be faster than you that's that's how yeah. fast you have to be as long as you think of it before they do and you have the right tools to break in not saying that i'm endorsing looting but i am <laughs> and once you do that then you're then you're gonna be in pretty good shape get a hold of the stuff before and then you want to get some distractions going in some cases if, like for example if you know that you see the mob next to the grocery store right and you see the stores, you know, over blah, blah, blah. And they haven't figured this out yet. You can tell. It's like they're not there. And by the way, you don't go in the front doors. You go in the back. You never go in through the front where people can see you. Make sure as few people. And and I'm not necessarily saying you should set fires as distractions in, in a different part of the of the city. But people, kind of like moths to a flame, people are distracted by fires. And they will, you know, especially in a nighttime scenario. And by the way, don't go during the daytime. Uh... And then there's, you know, the, the other stuff, which is, you know, the, the, st most of its frame of mind, which is know who you're, if you're going to hang out with people, I know there's safety in numbers, know who you're hanging out with, Tr you know, there's got to be a level of trust there. Uh, little things like find out immediately. Like if you're in a group of 10 people, ask them immediately who's on prescription drugs right now. And I'm not mean like weird stuff. I'm saying, is there a drug you're on right now that, if you cut your dosage in half and then half again, can you get off of it in the next 30 days or 45 days? Because if you can't. That's a really important question to ask when people are making their survival preparedness plan, yeah. whether it be for your own family or whatever. Yeah. Somebody who requires a medication. Yeah. To, you know, live or yeah. like, I'll throw this out even, even further still diabetics and asthmatics. Oof. Rock. Okay, understand that we are talking about an environment where insulin and inhalers are no longer coming. Yeah, there you go. That's a, that's a very basic cut bare line yeah. to draw where it's like, okay, we either need to start making plans or finding out alternate solutions that we can replicate with very little resources. Yeah, or if you're on something as simple, what it sounds as simple as like Xanax. Like yeah. Xanax is not something you just stop. People be it's like people don't understand. The doctors don't explain it to them. It's like if you try to go cold turkey off of some of these drugs, you could have a psychotic break. And and oh. people don't don't understand what that means. It's like your mood goes so far off the deep end that you may not come back. And oh yeah. Oh dude, I got on steroids for one month and I didn't take beta blockers whenever I got off of them. Yeah. I was the most emotional wreck a human could ever be. I was literally like, because my, uh, my estrogen levels were trying to bounce back. Right. Because it's like, 
that's what your body would, does. It just tries to equalize. Dude, I swear I was thinking, and no disrespect, hopefully everybody understands this, I was thinking exactly like a woman. Like, not in like a sexual <laughs> weird way, but like, I was so emotional about fucking everything, dude. I just couldn't stop. Like, somebody would say something, I'd be like, are you mad at me? Like, what What did I do? Like, that's like, how you can tell a bodybuilder that's off the test. They're like the world's biggest bitches, and they're just thinking about every sad thing that's ever happened to them ever, and they're just about like everything. It's like, dude, you are putting up five hundred pounds on bench. What are you crying about, just, dude? It's a real thing for uh, sure. Your next hit, gotcha. Two two more things, really quick, from the book. Um, one would be, uh, it, again, there's some ethical issues here, but look, it's 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 a crisis situation, which is we're talking survival mode. The yeah, rule, yeah. It's like, look, stock up on tradable things and i don't mean just the, the stuff that you would use stuff that you wouldn't use necessarily right <laughs> you know alcohol cigarettes that are still in the pack i don't care how old they are i mean people will absolutely trade I, again i'm not saying take advantage of people that have vices but right. people with vices will trade anything for this stuff uh the, the, i use the line from the kevin costner movie the postman which i love so much uh well i maybe it's too strong a word i love the beginning of it when he tipped over the cigarette machine and he found like 12 packs that were jammed in the back of the machine right and they were old as freaking dirt but they were still sealed and he said two words he goes i'm rich and he was he bought himself <laughs> into a community just using those packs of cigarettes little bottles of alcohol uh prescription drugs i don't care if they're expired or not if they're the good kind of you know what i'm talking about there's a lot of prescription drugs out there they're very very tradable um one of the best preppers i ever met the man had like 20 bottles of jim beam jack daniels yep. you name it just random whiskeys yep and whenever i saw this i didn't realize that i was standing in a prepper cabin at the time i thought it was a hunting cabin right we were we were borrowing the lease for the weekend whatever yep. and i was like damn dude i didn't realize you were that heavy of a drinker he's like oh i i'm i'm clean and sober i haven't touched a drop in 30 years and i was like so what's all this for he's like oh that's for bartering yeah and i'm like oh Bart Bart now you got to be careful i i even put a the you'll you'll probably enjoy the last chapter i even put like a bartering cyst or a um uh, like a station, like converting like an old post office into like a bartering station where you could hire kids. Boy, I'm really going down a dark road here. Where you can hire younger people. <laughs> what meridian are we going, man? To, to like, <laughs> to like, to like go and loot houses and potentially, you know, use your place as sort of like a bank where you take a commission. Oh my God. Again, you could turn it into a whole new little economy. Last but not, 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 not least on that, which is, um, and again, it's just a reminder to people. It's like, look, if you don't like guns, that's that's one thing. But you got to understand, at least in America, you will be facing guns. There's a lot of guns out there. A lot of people got guns and they got a lot of guns. I know people and I'm a I'm kind of on the mindset. It's like you shouldn't own any more guns that you can physically carry. But or in one shot. But then again, that's a whole nother thing. But they but, but I that, respectfully disagree. Sir. I know. I know. I, I, and, and by the way, I don't. I, I can't. I can't even say that even today I could pull that off. <laughs> but yeah, I'll, give, I'll give you this caveat. I'll agree with you that every member of my household there you should go. just shoot at one time. There you go. There I have five people I'm, living in my house. So hey. But what I what I try to for the people, it's like I don't want to kill anybody. It's like fine. You're, you're gonna have to shoot them in the legs or do something. You don't have to kill them, right? Uh, in fact, I I encourage people like, oh, shoot them in the legs. They go. It's like they they have to carry themselves out and truth. And come on. That's there aren't going to be any hospitals you're going to go to, so they're going to be screwed anyway. But so. keep in mind, if you let them go, they can come back and find you again with a larger number of people. So once again, we're talking morals and ethics are out the window when we're talking survival mode. We are truly talking about an environment where you don't know if you're waking up to see tomorrow morning. Yeah, and when I'm just time, you got to do whatever it takes to protect you and your family. I get it. Yeah, I'm just not a I'm not a fan of. It's just the work, which is like shooting a really fat guy, you know, then, then what? I mean, because if they're, you know, then it's like, oh my God, he's like 280. He's like, what do I really have to drag him out of here? Do I have to go mobster style? What am I going to do? Oh, so you shoot him in the leg, make them drag themselves out. Then drag themselves out. Then, yeah. Then it's like, do. hopefully okay, the, so you don't the, make them go and dig their own hole. That's a bit. No, no, no. I'm <laughs> hoping the coyotes jump, jump jumping at that point. Uh, yeah, I dig or, this, man. Or the dogs. Okay. Anyway, sorry. What what questions? Let's let's focus. What questions do you have left? What do you got? Okay. 
So uh, one of the big questions, and I have a couple of them, but okay. one of the questions that I have as far as Flat Earth goes yeah. is that uh, a lot of people who aren't Flat Earthers, and I will say, Jacob, you may be included to to a point on this question. Okay. A lot of people who are anti-Flat Earth or who are just globe tards, whatever you want to call them, uh, they will say that uh, that uh, people who are coming out and only talking about flat Earth and they're getting into these arguments, they're only there just to divide even more, just like politics, just like religion, just like everything else. It's just a divisive tactic. And some people have gone even uh, have even gone as far as to say that it could be something that is actually being pushed in a weird way by. Uh, name your three-letter agency. What do you say oh, to that? Yeah. Oh, oh, the the, the counter flat, Earth, flat Earth is a giant long-term psyop. Yeah, right. No. No. Now, for it, the record, it, no, I am not a member of that community. I am somebody who can see how it is. A, it's a dividing topic between us and the truth or community, right? Because we can all agree that like 9/11 was an inside job. We can all agree that JFK getting assassinated was a hoax. We can all agree we're getting screwed by our government. Boom, boom, boom. But as soon as flat earth gets fielded, there's immediate lines drawn and now names start getting called. And I don't believe that, you know, every right. flat earther is that type, but it is, it can be a I, I, fighting factor. That's all I'm saying. I understand the perception of it. Uh, I remember back in 2015, because that's when we really caught a lot of the hell. Now, not as much, not not nearly as much. We've been doing it too long. But back in the day, I remember there was some 9-11 guys that were all over me saying, you are distracting from the biggest conspiracy of all time, the most important, the only one we should focus on. And I go, well, physically speaking, no offense, you know, that was about a couple buildings in one city in one country, and we're talking about the whole world. So, right. but, but they didn't like it. I mean, they, they didn't kind of, I, and I, I get it. Look, I was one of those guys. I was like, oh yeah, that's, that's way up there. But this is physically speaking on such a, on such a big scale that uh, I can understand why they were, they were that way. And I only caught hell from the nine 11 guys. That was it. The rest of them, everybody else, I mean, uh, JFK so far in the rear view mirror, no offense. And I totally am with you there, man. And again, love, love the fact that, that they they got the people to believe that a lone gunman got through security and then was killed by a lone gunman who also got through security within like right. 48 hours. Blows my mind that you could convince people of that. Um, but no, no, I don't think, uh, no, I, I have never. In fact, I'll even take it one step further, which is I don't even think there are shills within our community because they're too tough to find. Meaning you can't fake being one of our community. Uh, I, I can't tell you how many meetups and conferences and stuff we've done or people that create content where, yeah, d could we be infiltrated? Sure. Could there be agents that are actually in our community sh that have showed up at meetups and I didn't even recognize? Sure. Possibly. But there's something about it. it, it there's some religious overtones to this. Once you snap into, into our, our section, there's something behind the eyes where people get sniffed out. You know, there have been trolls that have tried to hit us in, in different uh, meetups and, and conferences, and they all get sniffed out really, really quickly. Yeah. So uh, so when people say, oh, this is person's a shill and that person's a shill, it's like, no. Uh, do we have personality conflicts? You bet. No different sure. than uh, any other community. I'll use the actors community because that's it's so blatant, which is people understand when they're on talk shows, it's tough to get actors to sincerely talk about other actors because they all hate each other. Not because they're bad people, because they're competition. Uh, yeah. you know, the, the, in, in Flyers community, social media is the same way. Pe there are certain people that do not like to share the stage. And if you don't like to share the stage, who's ever trying to upstage you? Oh, no, no, no. You're the enemy and I'm going to discredit you. To That was to your point, by the way, earlier, which is why do politicians always tear into each other instead of building up themselves? That is mostly because with psychology studies have shown that the general public loves that negative shit. You know, they love they love dirt. They love gossip. It's like, oh, you're going to tear down. Ooh, that's schoolyard. There's an old saying, um, uh, which is high school is everywhere. The, the things we learn in high school, all that stupid stuff that, that you think we grow out of, you don't really grow out of it. You, you just, you, there's just little, more mature levels of it. It evolved. Right. Right. Which is, which is also, by the way, legally, you can't do it from a corporate standpoint, right? You'll never see Ford running an ad that says Chevy trucks suck. 
they'll always pump up themselves because legally you can't say that because they know they've already done the studies. They know how that affects people. Otherwise, you just get negative, you know, ads and nobody would that kills the market as a, you know, people would be like, I'm not even going to buy a car because apparently all cars suck, <laughs> says everybody. Anyway, right. What else you got? All right. <clears throat> Next one I got is um so something that I, I actually have another podcast is called Meta Mysteries and we cover a lot of things on there a lot of weird spiritual woo woo some might say yeah. um I've uh, I've I'm actually a, a licensed hypnotherapist oh, and this is, something, this is something that I really you know wanted to bring up especially to you because it fits perfectly in line yeah. Um, and that is, is that, you know, whenever, and, and I document like a lot of my past life regressions on Metamisters, that's why I brought it up. But um, uh, one of the things that I noticed that was really weird is that whenever I hypnotize, quote unquote, flat earthers, yeah. and whenever I hypnotize other people who maybe don't have an opinion or maybe they think it's a ball or whatever, sure. typically whenever... It, this is how I do it. Whenever somebody dies, I send them through what is called the death process. It sounds grueling. It's really not. Right. Um, and what happens is, is that it's essentially their consciousness, their soul, their spirit, whatever you want to say, it rises above wherever their body is and almost weirdly like out into the universe. Right. And they kind of look down, if especially if they're curious about the shape of the earth, which right. is, you know, kind of funny. But, um, well, it's funny because of this reason. Um, whenever they look down at the shape of the earth, usually if they're flat earthers, they'll see a flat earth, yeah. right? If they're ball earthers, or maybe they're, you know, that's just the majority of people are probably ball earthers. That's what they're taught. They'll see a big ball right sure. down below them. I question, well, my thing is, is that are we actually the renderers of our own reality? And the reason I say that is, is because, all right, well, if perspective really is reality and all those people that are rising up, I get it. It's a past life regression. Like do with that as you will. Some people don't even believe that that's real and that's, right. that's fine. But I, I wonder, is the world just what we think it is? Are we the manifestors of our reality? Um, is there truly like a double slit experiment where something's totally different whenever we're observing it than whenever we're not? Um, what do you think about that? And like, I mean, do you think that we're actually the renderers of our own reality in a sense, not completely yeah, kind of in a sense? I do. I do. Um, it is something, again, we've been striving for in, in games for in, in our simulations for a long time. Uh, it's called instancing, which is we, we now have the ability to instance, to create our regional perception tailored to not just a local area but the individual itself i'll give you a quick example um you and a friend are in a game you're talking over whatever wireless headset and you both see the belt of orion in the sky right and you say oh yeah the belt of orion the center star is green and your friend says no it's red who's right technically both of you are right because you're both watching you could because we can tailor it individually sort of like uh the corpuscular rays situation whereas corpuscular rays look the same no matter where you are no matter where you're standing but that's not possible right i mean you take a picture of it it's like oh no the rays are coming right from here and your friend 500 miles down that way he's saying oh no they're they're this way um david has done some wonderful wonderful things on that um but yes i i i do agree that that i mean it leads into a ooh, that's a big question but i i'll try to keep it brief which is how many people when when you ask something like that you gotta ask a second question which is how many people are act real people are actually in here right because it, again if it's interactive at all or how many people even did a pre-record where where they're actually intersecting it kind of ties into that really good thought-provoking movie and it gets better every time i watch it which is the adjustment bureau which I is that movie. Oh yeah. Which is, you know, I was like, all I cared about was that damn book. I want to see the freaking book and, and cause all the symbols and I know it was really vague, but the intersection points where people met and there were lots of, lots of people that didn't intersect, but what I think they were getting at without getting at it, which was, there's a lot of people that the intersection points don't count because these are people who are just background noise. So yeah, no, I agree. I, I agree that people create their own reality. And yeah, it does not surprise me that during near death experience, cause why, why would you confuse somebody? with uh you know some people see the globe and some people see the flat earth why would you confuse 
you should probably ask him again, the flat earthers, did they ever see a globe? You know, meaning do flat earthers now ever, well, I mean, how many times can you near death? You should probably talk to some astro projecting people. Because the astral projector people that I talked to said, oh, yeah, they saw globes until it became flat earthers, kind of like what you're saying. And then they only saw flat earth. But until right. that you point, know, they saw the globe. Like, now, these past life regressions that he puts people through, this yeah. is something that can be repeated and done again and have multiple past lives. So now that poses a whole different question, Jonathan. Have you ever asked the same person who has had multiple hypnosis sessions if they saw round versus flat and every time it was round or you only asked this question one time, what have your studies shown thus far? Well, typically, I mean, I've only been doing it for like three years. So yeah. the chances that I get somebody right in the sweet zone where the first time I hypnotize them, they were a ball earther. And the second time I hypnotize them, they were a flat earther. Like that's, that's going to be rare. Can um, but that being said, I'm very open to that. Like if somebody, I don't know. I mean, I, I know many of ball earthers, you know, that maybe might one day make the transition to a flat earth. That would be really the only way to figure that out. Can, um, can, and, I, and, and, you know, it's, it is really strange because that's, that's something that messes with the mind a little bit because it's like, all right, well now you're questioning, you know, is this, is, am I really visiting a past life? Well, I think the answer is, or the question is actually a lot more simple. And the, the question is like, all right, what exactly is reality if it changes every time my perception changes? Um, mm. can, can, I, can I jump in on that one for a sec? Um, and okay. by the way, I don't call them past lives as much as I call them. This will circle back to one of your earlier things called parallel lives. Yes. Which is, I was, uh, when, you know, digging into this enough, again, if this was virtual, uh, then you, you, the, the, the common question people ask is, you know, what's outside of this place? And I say, well, what's out of this side of this place has to be the opposite of what's in it because i'm a big believer in dualism which is you cannot appreciate one thing without the other hot and cold light and shadow pain and pleasure um anyone that tries to do only one they're just ruined you know that's why trust fund kids are just worthless but and if this world apply that to this world if this world is 99.9 .9 conflict right so it doesn't matter how beautiful how powerful how talented how rich you are there's always something to complain about in fact when you reach those extreme levels most of those people are are just they're just the conflict comes out even harder right beautiful people stuck to the mirror constantly rich people just care about more money talented people think they're frauds uh, and powerful people they just want more power there's not there's no such thing as too much power for the powerful well, if that's the case, if this place is 99% conflict, then I firmly believe that what's outside of here is 99% unlimited. You, know, you want to call it heaven, Shambhala, Nirvana, whatever it is. Um, I call it the, um, the the genie wish machine, which is, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll get this. In fact, a Twilight Zone episode was based on this years and years ago, but I'm sure there's stories as well, which is a, a genie, you rub a lamp, genie comes out, gives you three wishes, but you're super clever. So you say, I want unlimited wishes. So you start wishing for all the cool stuff, right? You, every profession you ever, I'm a rock star, I'm a baseball star, I'm an actor, I'm a whatever, you know, I'm a mogul. You date everyone you ever wanted to date. You also make yourself immortal and in perfect health right away because you don't want to screw that up and, and money, that's way down on the list. You do all these things and you live a very, very long time. Thousands of years as a matter of fact, right? Well, the problem is, is I've got a, I've got a funny feeling that part of this universe runs off of novelty meaning what's new. You know, we uh, steal a line from Agent Smith, you know, without purpose, we wouldn't exist. If you don't have goals, and I don't care what level you're on, you're going to run out of things to do. And uh, which is why I think Einstein said that imagination is more impor important than knowledge. Clever guy, you know, very, you know, did a lot of greeting cards. I get that now. Imagination is more important than knowledge. Knowledge is just stated facts. Imagination, though, you can run for a long time on that. Well, when your imagination is tapped out, let's say with this genie, what do you do? Right. Eventually, you have to go to him and say, okay, dude, what can I, uh, can you help me out here? I'm stuck. I'm tapped. I got nothing left. I've done everything I ever wanted to do. It took me 4,000 years or whatever it is to, to do. And he's like, well, I got an idea for you. You're not going to like it very much, but here's the idea. I'm going to send you this place. Really conflicting, really short lifespan, 70, 80 years. You're going to hate it. Million ways to die. All sorts of conflict. It's going to be miserable. And most of the time, there's going to be some good moments, but most of the time, you're not going to like it very much. It's like, wow, <laughs> what's so great about that? Well, because when you're done there and you come back here, you're going to think this is the greatest thing ever. It's like, wow, there's got to be a catch, right? Of course there's a catch. You know what the catch is? No, what is it? Are you going to do it? I don't know. What is it? 
All right, I'll do it. All right, the catch is, you're not even going to remember this conversation. And he snaps his <laughs> fingers and he puts in a memory block and voila, you are you are in a place like this. So when it comes to people saying, when it comes to past lives, I think they're parallel lives, which is why you know, people say, it's like, why do so many people think they were Caesar or Napoleon or all those funny things? And it's like, yeah, why wouldn't you? You can come in as anybody you want if you if you really wanted to. Uh, or or when you were in the the what I call the near perfect, the, you know, that unlimited universe or realm, that's that's where it is. And I know it's kind of sounds like the meaning of life, but I do believe it's cyclical because that's no, no, that, that's sorry. kind of the whole premise behind this. And I hear you. And yeah, fine. If it is a little bit of the the meaning of life, well, we've been talking about matrix theory and the entire right, right. time. So I mean, hey, go for it. It it just it it's just for me it would make sense because it would re constantly refresh itself, and it would be voluntary. If you guys want to look up some fun stuff, uh, look up the um, I don't know you probably delved into it. Look up the five tracing boards of the Masons. You know, there's only five, and when I first saw them, I'm not a Mason or anything, but when I first saw them, they read and while I was into software, they read like software instructions meaning the the first slide it was in order like the first slide was a quick start guide what you're supposed to do second slide was uh, how you get in third one was your goal or when you die fourth one was how you get out and the fifth one was an achievement screen which uh which was called the the royal arch or something like that and we didn't even have achievement screens until 2015 they didn't even exist in the video game world until 2015 so how who told the freaking masons hundreds of years ago to to make these damn things and I do, and I do believe it's voluntary. That's the kicker, which is with, you know, the, again, the circle back to um, why, you know, why does God let bad things happen to good people, right? It's like, oh, no, 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 no. You volunteered to be here, kiddo. You know, you, you, in fact, the, if you look at the tracing boards, it looks like an amusement park ride where there's multiple people you have to go through. One takes your ticket at the beginning, and then you still got to go through this weavy thing and you get to the door and there's another guy that lets you in the door. You have every chance in the world to back out and you came here voluntarily. And why wouldn't you? This is you, because that's what you would ask for. It's like, look, I need to refresh. I need to, uh, I need to get a new perspective or reset or whatever it is just my take on it but it certainly makes uh makes some sense to me i hear you but i do have one question yeah why is your why do you believe that this existence is like 99 percent conflict why okay. why do i think this world is 99 percent conflict now i'm with you to the realm of what the other side might be might be what we would call divine perfect right. the programmer whatever the case may be right to say this world has conflict of a thousand percent who can deny this but I would argue that this world exists almost disgustingly harmoniously. And what I mean by that is I would say that there is almost equal parts positive and negative happening at any given time on Earth. And I'm not saying there's equal parts good and bad people. I'm saying there's good and bad actions, decisions, words, intentions, all the things all the way through being done by people you could argue are good and bad and flawed heroes and everything in between. But I would say that this existence is almost like really angrily, I might add, harmoniously balanced. I agree that the programmer being in the all good, but would that not arguably mean that there is an all bad realm of place, existence, whatever? And I don't necessarily mean hell. Right, right, I right. To be more akin to like there's a programmer to a program. Right. And would there not therefore be a realm of the virus? If or if this is even a, a, a apples to oranges comparison. Right, right, right. Um, two things there. One would be, um, do you, you're, you're right in the aspect where I do, I think the scales, the energy scales, do they balance out? Sure. In fact, when you take people and you've heard this argument a million times, you take people out of here, this world works great all the time. Right. It's boring. You know, and you're watching, unless you're watching basically without people, it just becomes this giant never ending series of wild kingdom, which is fine, but it's boring. Um, right. but people even though they, the, the scales balance out, for whatever reason, human beings dwell, again, steal, steal the line from uh, Agent Smith, which is human beings seem, you know, to, to what was it? Um, to, Hell to, bent on destroying themselves. Yeah, to, well, to dwell in misery, yeah. you know, to, misery and suffering, you know, and, and a perfect world, they, their primitive minds couldn't adjust to it. 
which is people seem, human beings seem to dwell on the negative. Yeah, you're right. The, the scales balance out, but people don't, don't focus on that. I mean, how many times, anyone listening, how many times have people, they'll do 20 positive comments in a row. They read them. It's like, you're great. You're wonderful. What a great thing. And then the first negative comment shows up. It's like, you suck. That's all they focus on. That's all yeah. they care about. And so they magnify that. And which is what what gets them into trouble with the the conflict part of it. Again, a beautiful person, like you know, models, right? And I've a new friend that ran a modeling agency, and he's going, dude, they're all insane. And I go, why? He goes, because as beautiful as they are, they just stare at the mirror and hope to God it doesn't go away. And the first wrinkle that shows up ruins their month, and then it's just a downward spiral from there. Doesn't matter. Just, people could line up. It's here, so beautiful. You're so gorgeous. The first, they don't even have to hear it from the outside source. They even think it and it's, and it consumes them. I mean, how yeah. many celebrities I kind of, I, uh, akin it to, um, the EKG meter on a heart, you know, a heart thing where yeah. I think there's like three levels of people, the NPCs, their, their meter is just super, super narrow banded and nothing ever happens to them. Um, then you have like the interactives, which, you know, are people that can interact with both types that the EKG meter goes up and down, but it's not, it's generally within safety parameters. And then you have what I call the creatives, which are the shining examples of people that we look up to, you know, the, the stars and all these different things, but my God, the tragic backstories. And, and it's like, not only can you die from an overdose, you know, you're too happy and you die from an overdose, or you can get depressed and die from an overdose or whatever. The EKG meter is so far off the freaking charts, but yes, to your, to your point. Yeah. The, um, now, but one more thing, do I, do I believe there's a hell? Sure. Or a, I don't want to say necessarily a hell ran yeah, by a it, fork. I mean, we could take the cartoon bullshit out of it for two yeah. seconds. To say that there is an all good or an all benevolent a programmer, a creator, right. and to say that we are some sort of a harmonious, neutral chaos nonetheless, but right. harmoniously balanced to the point of existing, right. does that not imply that there is also the alternative? I think there's just, I personally think there's just darker versions of this. You know, if you want to go to, I mean, this is pretty balanced, but I'm pretty sure there's other versions of this that aren't. Um, there was a wonderful show recommended highly to you guys. Um, uh, it was an episode of Black Mirror called, I think it was won awards called San San Junipero. Fuck where, yeah, I love that episode. Oh my god, that, that, that episode won awards, and it should. Yeah. I mean, where the afterlife, the the digital afterlife, was broken to 1980 to 1989. Oh my God. It was so, it was so, but even then, even with those perfect 80 to, and those are great years, 80 to 89 years, you still had the dark dungeony club that people would go to just because they wanted to feel something extreme. Right. Even though they were suffering, it was like, it was like pain and pleasure on, on, you know, both ends. They were feeling the super highs and the super lows simultaneously. Uh, and I could see that it's like, oh yeah, yeah, of course they would, you know, some people, but there's other people to be like perfectly happy just jumping between years. But yeah, Black Mirror haunting. Oh dude, that's one of the best series ever created ever. Yeah. yeah. Like it's, it's beyond great. Yeah. Um, one more thing I want to bring up to you, Mark. Yeah. Um, and this is kind of where I come from as far as what could the possible shape in quotations, what the shape of the earth could be. Sure. And I've, uh, I've kind of grown to believe this because, you know, for my whole life, I, you know, up until I was about 25, 26, I was just like a globe earther, like everybody else, not really thinking twice about it. Right. Then I started stumbling across your work and Daryl Marble and, and all the, all the great like flat earthers. Right. Thanks. And, um, and, uh, and, and ODD or ODT or I can't OD, remember. ODD. What. Yeah. Stands for overdose Denver, by the way. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. He was out. Okay. He was out in Denver um, with we were all like Bob from Globusters, ODD, and we were all in Colorado at the same time. Wow. So that would be a hell of a union right there. Yeah. That was kind of fun. Anyway, um, go ahead. So, you know, I, I, I started out Glober came to be a flat earther as a result of, you know, just going down a YouTube binge rabbit hole with all of y'all. And uh, over the years, you know, I've kind of stepped into my own spiritual understanding of things. And I, who's to say if I got it right or wrong? Who knows? Um, but that being said, I kind of look at, have you ever seen a picture of a uh, double toroid? I'll Rich. share it for you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Put, throw it up on the thing. All right. So double toroid. Let's see if I can uh, move that right here. 
And for anybody who would like to see what Jonathan is pulling up, Jonathan, tell them where they can find it. You can go to patreon.com slash cult of conspiracy podcast or rockfin.com slash cult of conspiracy over there. Yeah, we I've, seen have, it. I've seen it. You've seen this before. Yeah, it's Greg? good. It's a cool right. image. So uh, focusing on this right here, and I don't know whether this is right or wrong, but it kind of makes the most sense as to why it could be round and flat at the same time. So if you're looking right here, it looks kind of globular, but then you got this thing right here in the middle called the plane of inertia. Oh. And could that be, you know, uh, it looks kind of like a matrix grid in a sense. Yeah. Could that be just, you know, it rendering before our eyes, according to our perception of whatever the fuck is going through you know, our pupils or whatever. Um, I don't know. I mean, it, it's possibly this one, this one is like a happy medium. And I guess I'm kind of playing the fence on the on flat earth and globe with this one. But honestly, this makes the most sense hmm. to me anyway. It's pretty cool. No, I, I have seen them before. By the way, I like the the image, uh, the the earth, the one they tried to turn into the donut earth there. That's kind of fun. Right here. Yeah. yeah. Oh, <laughs> of course, it's in space. Yeah. Beautiful. I did not know that was supposed to be the earth. I'm going to be honest with you. I thought that was supposed to be a bagel in space. And like that was supposed to be the meme. I didn't realize that was supposed to. Be I don't I don't even think I don't think it's even supposed to be funny. Now, the ones below it, like the actual donut earth down there. There you, there you go. go. Uh, uh, although that's probably a science journal. Who knows? Oh, yeah, it says science and technology. Here's the possibility of a donut-shaped planet in existence. Oh, of yeah. course. You know, but hey, I mean, wow. that's not going to get taken down off of YouTube and give you all the strikes and everything no, else. No, no. Go uh, why do you think... Deal with YouTube, that's why we're on Patreon Rockfin. Exactly. But why is it, I mean, if 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 the flat earth model is such a joke and it's so appalling, why do they continue to take everything flat earth off of youtube off of the internet the only thing you ever see is just anti-flat earth or people making fun of flat earth i mean if it's so like ridiculous then why why even bother to go why, through all why bury it that yeah. is a good one or why ads you know youtube has changed a lot in the last nine years um the fact that they do a wiki entry underneath you know we were the ones that started by the way it's not just us anymore there's wiki entries for all sorts of fun topics but oh, we yeah. were the ones it's like, oh no, we're gonna add a wiki entry. Now that again, they don't they don't pull us off the internet. They suppress us to where all you know, and they didn't even have to try that hard. All they do is they give preference to all the major channels that that do um anti-flat earth videos. And there's a lot of them. There's huge. I mean, just about every verified channel you can think of has has done a flat earth video at this point. Um, but yeah, I, I think there's something to it. My bigger question is why did they promote us? Again, if you believe in the Babylon protocol, which I do, why did they promote us for three years straight? And I mean, promoted us shamelessly. Um, did they do it just for the money? You know, that, uh, one programmer from France, uh, part of the, um, the documentary, the social dilemma, which I loved. If you ever get a chance, check that out where they're talking about how social media expanded into this Frankenstein monster. And he, they asked him, you know, why do things get recommended for you on the right-hand side? Because he was the guy that wrote the routine for it. And remember, YouTube is a, just a giant, it's the biggest television network, well, the biggest network in the world. Uh, it has so much content, it's lifetimes, thousands of lifetimes worth of content. And, he, and of all the topics, you know, there's thousands of, of uh, topics on YouTube. He, he mentions one and he goes, well, if the average person that gets into flat earth watches 20 videos in a row, what do you think we're going to recommend? I was like, oh yeah, I see what you're doing there. You're going to promote, and because we were, we were getting promoted. And then after th those first three years, really, when it started, they started cracking down. Was when we were tracking the numbers. We were, we were watching the metrics. They, they killed the scoreboard because of us. If you didn't, if, if David didn't already tell you, where you know when you went to YouTube, you type in a topic, and it would say search results equals equals a number. Yeah. And then in summer of 2018, when I made this little video called Flat Earth Catches the President of the United States, because we were tracking at 20.9 relevant search results, million uh, versus Donald Trump 20.8. And then yeah. uh, a few weeks later, that's when they uh, they removed that line. So now search results forever, by the way, search results equals the number. is It doesn't exist anymore. It's like, wow, that's awfully strange for a search engine. Oh, my but, God. Yeah, was, it was it was Earth bad. Was doing better than Donald Trump, which is. Are you we one of the biggest political people ever to exist? I will send you I will send you the link to the playlist. I mean, well, I was having fun with the scoreboard because I was looking up everything from NASA to Neil Tyson to the Beatles to the Simpsons to Warcraft. And we were just climbing this ladder to where there was only a few people ahead of us at the time. Relevant search results is, by the way, not to be confused with sub count. 
you know, for people to buy subs. So like PewDiePie, what, had 60 million subs, but he only had 5 million um, relevant search results. That's because nobody was making videos about him. The, he had a whole bunch of subs. It's like, wow, where'd they come from? He didn't buy them from an offshore account, did he? Eh, who knows? But the only people that were ahead of us were people like Katy Perry, Taylor Swift, um, Justin Bieber, uh, you know, people like that. And so there were we were getting into pretty rare air. And then all of a sudden, and I get it. I, I totally understood the the nerd uh, meeting on that one where somebody, because they were trying to figure out how to ratio us and mess with the filters. And somebody at the end of the, the table says, just kill it. Just kill the whole line. Who's going to care? They're the only ones that are watching it anyway. So, you know, they don't say anything about it. So that's what they did. That in the Senate hearing where they said they were going to monetize us 70% less. During a Senate hearing, for God's sakes. Wow. What was that about? They get killed off, they, which was the weirdest thing. They said, we're going to make, we're going to ban snake oil. We're, I'm sorry, what's now known as medical misinformation. Medical misinformation, we're going to ban um, um, uh, false flags. You can't say anything as a false flag where anyone dies. And we're going to ban um, the 2020 Trump election, which they finally rolled back because now we're in 2024 and there's another election. Otherwise, YouTube would be banning people all the time because people are going to be referencing 2020 this year. Right. And uh, and then they said, we're going to recommend Flat Earth less. I mean, they literally said that's during the, the thing and people kind of laughed and chuckled about it, you know, and it's like because it's like oh okay you know because that's a thing right and it's like oh my god and i remember jaron on those guys it's like really you're gonna monetize us less that's a really bad bad thing yeah he no. did everybody we we are everyone was like comparing notes rob skiba was like it's like dude he goes i'm making 70 percent less off of youtube it's like damn it it's oh, like well no. we're not banned so that's something i guess i guess just get my legs chopped out from under us but that's yeah. whatever yeah, it was it was it was pretty bad. I did not. So, how long have you been at this game of I don't want to say flat eartherism, but let's say and I don't want to say content creation either cuz that that's also not what I would call this. How long have you been putting the word out there in this way? 9 years. 9 almost, years. Almost almost to the day. Um uh, I literally I had a YouTube channel, you know, when it came out, I was you know just watching crap and then in 2015 was when February 10th, 2015 was when, again, I had that weird moment where I woke up in the middle of the night and I said, you know what? I've got a question for the internet. It wasn't like I was even preaching. I said, I need this answered. And I said, I don't think I, I'm not a big globe guy anymore. Here's why I've got my motivation. And I put all my contact information out there and said, Internet Hive Mind, which I still think is fairly smart. The Hive, not, the hive not to be confused with mob rules. Right. Uh, somebody's going to catch something. And all of a sudden, people started calling me, reinforcing it with different different aspects. And so, yeah, nine years. Never, never, never backed off of it. And I do believe in everything for a reason. I do believe in fate. And all I had to do is say yes. So, um, uh, if I again, if I live long enough to write an autobiography, it's going to be called Unsolicited. I never even had to pick up the phone. In fact, there was funny. Um, again, we were talking just as we started this whole thing, where like coast to coast, I, there the producer from coast to coast calls me up, and I didn't really even know who they were. Right? <laughs> it's like I've heard heard of them, and she's like, "All right, well, this flat Earth thing." She goes, "She goes, I want to talk to you about it." She goes, "Um, you know," she goes, "What's uh, what's the title of your book?" And I go. Yeah, what? I don't have a book, right? It's like, okay, what's your DVD? And I go, uh, and she goes, what's your freaking website? And I go, look, I've only been doing this a few weeks, right? I I don't even, I, she goes, why am I talking to you? I go, I don't know, you called me. I go, why right. Why are we talking? And she goes, give me the nickel tour. She goes, she goes, I'll give you 10 minutes, go. And I go, pop, 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 pop. And she, and she puts me on. And I knew that there was something to it because I remember talking to Rob Skiba later and he goes, wow, I heard you. Cause that's how he got into it. Was he listened to, well, he listened to Canary cry, but he also listened to coast to coast. He, he asked me, he goes, he goes, wow. How many times did you have to solicit to, uh, to, you know, apply to get on the freaking show? I go, w what do you mean apply? <laughs> Cause I didn't know there's an application process. And he goes, he goes, they called you. And I go, yeah. And he goes, he goes, I've been trying for two and a half years to get on that show. And I was like, oh, okay. So that's when I kind of knew there was something else going on um, to where God was just 
throw it was like a like literally like an amusement park car parked in my living room with the door open and to get in and you're gonna go you know you'll be able to do some stuff with this like okay and i i honestly swear god is my witness i had no idea what i was doing no freaking idea i'd never even made a video before uh i'd never and you know never talked to producers before never done anything like that so And it's, and again, it's still, you know, it's not stopping, you know, during the mandate slowed it down. Obviously we couldn't travel internationally, but right. yeah, it, but yeah, nine, nine, sorry, long, long winded answer. Nine years, never, never stopped. I don't know if I could stop. Wow. <laughs> well, dude, I mean, you're, I mean, first of all, happy nine year anniversary. That's Thank you. a Thank you. Appreciate long it. time. We're coming up on four years here soon. Um, but yeah, it's, it's crazy. Whenever you put your mind to something, you keep on working at it and it's like really destiny just starts paving the road in front of you, yeah. uh, and, and, or fate, however you want to look at it. I, they're kind of interchangeable words. Yeah. Um, but you know, that being said, I mean, look, Mark, this was an absolute pleasure having you on here. You are you. definitely like you're, I've, I haven't been this excited for a guest in a long time. And we have a lot of great guests that come on, but you're like, we had fucking Tommy Chong on the show and I was more excited for you. Okay. Oh. Like that's how crazy this is for me. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate it. I do not consider myself really a, a celebrity to speak of. It was nice that the Netflix thing came out. Um, but I'm still, all I'm trying to, again, I'm just looking for truth and looking for answers and, Uh, you know, if I run into some great people along the way that 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 share that and that I can talk to, great, wonderful, and see where it goes. Hell yeah, yeah man. Uh, well, for anybody that has been living under a rock and doesn't know where to find the go to flat earth, how would they find you? If you want to put a, any of your information out there, feel free, man. Uh, it's easy. Uh, all you have to do is um, type, go into any search engine, type in flat earth mark. That's it. Uh, the other search stuff, don't type in flat earth clues or anything like that. It's going to be buried. Uh, you can go to pretty much any platform now. I don't know. I'm on, I, I'm on all sorts of things. I don't know who puts them up there. I got a wiki page. Don't know. I have any idea who did it. Do I have an IMDB page? No idea who did it. Wow. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's been fun, but yeah, all the stuff's out there. It will lead you down rabbit holes. Don't be afraid to, to, to listen to other people. The, the community is really great and really huge. Uh, and if you find my stuff, great. Uh, if you enjoy it, great. If you have questions, uh, the one, I, two things. One, my contact information is out there for everybody. I, I am so easy to find. You can literally go in and type in to Google Mark Sargent's email address, Mark Sargent's home address, Mark Sargent's phone number. Uh, you'll find me. Uh, and the other thing, last, I'll, I'll leave you with this. Um, everything I've talked about tonight, what, three hours, is uh, uh, don't, I'm not here to, um, convince you or persuade you i'm just here to give you some ideas let them rattle around your head and uh, see where it takes you you know in the end do your own research ask your own questions figure it out for yourself and if you need anything along the way try and find me i love it i love it dude i mean thanks again so much for coming back on eventually yeah. we'd love to do it again sometime man this was happy to do it this was great um uh, but until next time, this was another beautiful episode of The Cult of Conspiracy. And my name's Jonathan. I'm Jacob. And there's one very important, extremely vital piece of information we need you to learn just as soon as humanly possible. Open up that third eye.